Tesco, the American military adventure in Iraq. He's interviewed by retired Army Colonel and Dickinson College professor Jeffrey McCausland. Thomas Ricks and Jeffrey McCausland on Iraq, Sunday at 6 and 9 p.m. Eastern on Afterwards on C-SPAN 2. Afterwards is also available each week as a C-SPAN podcast. Now a hearing on regulating prescription drugs. You'll hear from government officials and later mothers whose children died from prescription drug abuse. After this, a look at how cities are preparing for disasters. To order. Good morning and thank you for being here today. This hearing addresses a very important aspect of drug abuse in our country and one that I do not believe is getting enough attention, and that is the non-medical use of prescription drugs as a form of drug abuse. This somewhat quiet form of drug abuse today is so common it is exceeded in prevalence only by marijuana use. Moreover, non-medical use of prescription drugs now supersedes marijuana as a pathway for initiates into the underworld of drug abuse. It is a problem facilitated by ease of access to the drugs and a perception that prescription drugs are safe because they are FDA approved. Nonetheless, the statistics about prescription drug abuse are incredibly alarming. To start with, <clears throat> according to the most recent household survey, approximately 6 million people were current users of prescription drugs for non medical purposes. Of the six million people abusing prescription drugs, most of them were abusing pain relievers such as Oxycontin, 4.4 million. The Drug Abuse Warning Network reported that 495,000 emergency room visits in 2004 related to the non-medical use of prescription drugs. The most recent Monitoring the Future survey measuring drug use among nations' adolescents found high rates of non-medical use of prescription pain relievers in each of the 8th, 10th, and 12th grade groups surveyed. The prevalence of Oxycontin use in particular has increased 40 percent since 2002. The National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University, CASA, found that between 1992 and 2003, the number of people abusing controlled prescription drugs increased 94 percent, twice the percentage increase of people abusing marijuana, five times the number of people abusing cocaine, and 60 times the number of people abusing heroin. CASA also found that teens who abuse controlled prescription drugs are twice as likely to use alcohol, five times more likely to use marijuana, 12 times more likely to use heroin, 15 times more likely to use ecstasy, and 21 times more likely to use cocaine than teens who do not abuse prescription drugs. The most recent attitude tracking study by the Partnership for Drug Free America found that teen abuse of prescription drugs stems from the ease of availability, the lack of stigma associated with street drugs, and the false belief that they are safe to use. I don't believe anyone can consider these very sobering statistics and survey results without concluding that the abuse of prescription drugs is a problem of epidemic proportions that demands focused attention and aggressive action by both the government and the private sector. One of the congressional initiatives for addressing the problem targets the use, the issue of obtaining controlled drugs over the Internet without a prescription. H.R. 8040, introduced by Chairman Davis and Ranking Member Waxman, amends the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act to establish disclosure standards for Internet pharmacies, prohibits Internet sites from selling or dispensing prescription drugs solely on the basis of online questionnaires, and provides additional authority for states to take action against illegal Internet pharmacies. I am interested in hearing from our administration officials here today about the administration's work on the prescription drug abuse problem. And I'm not interested, excuse me, I am interested in concrete actions, not in more general statements about, quote, working closely with other agencies, quote, encouraging solutions to the problem, or, quote, developing action plans, end quote, to address this issue. I'm tired of the empty rhetoric and long delays on important matters like this, and let me give you an example. As part of a hearing on November 18, 2004, I asked DEA a number of questions regarding methamphetamine abuse. I just received the responses to these questions last month on June 27, 2006. It took DEA 20 months to respond. That is an unreasonable delay in providing crucial information to Congress about methamphetamine abuse. Moreover, it took the administration almost two years after releasing its synthetic drug action plan in October 2004 to come up with what it calls a synthetic drug strategy, despite repeated calls from Congress and only after Congress had passed a bill on the subject, the Combat Meth Act. 
Despite being 20 months in the making, this, quote, strategy is full of platitudes that don't seem to be truly backed up with any assigned responsibility or interim goals prior to the end of this administration. I don't want to hear platitudes today. I hope the administration witnesses are listening closely to me right now. I want OMDCP to tell us what it means in terms of concrete steps when it says it is going to, quote, call together representatives from the medical and pharmaceutical communities to, quote, discuss the problem and to encourage them to educate patients. What does ONDCP mean in terms of con concrete steps with its recommendation to, quote, continue to support the efforts of firms that manufacture frequently diverted pharmaceutical products to reformulate their products so as to reduce diversion and abuse, end quote. I want to know if the FDA has responded to Congress's year-old request for a report on how the agency might handle priority review of abuse-resistant formulations of prescription controlled drugs. This report was requested with the FDA appropriations bill last year. Where is it? Why hasn't FDA provided guidance on this important matter? I am asking FDA to provide this report to Congress and provide specific legislative recommendations for the reauthorization of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act that will provide incentives for developing and allow for accelerated approval of abuse-resistant forms of highly abused drugs. Since the Prescription Drug User Fee Act is important to the FDA's bottom line, I expect the FDA to provide this information promptly. I also want to know what the DEA really means when it says it is, quote, working closely, end quote, with the FDA to urge the rapid reformulation of OxyContin. My staff has asked DEA officials about this on at least two occasions over the last 12 months, and DEA could not provide the staff with anything concrete about its statement. I want to know the bar. I want to know what bar the DEA would set for categorizing a controlled drug reformulation as, quote, abuse resistant. I know that the National Institute on Drug Abuse has devoted significant resources to studying this problem, and I want to know what the Institute's research is showing about prescription drug abuse and treatment and how we can apply this research to overcoming this tremendous problem. Despite what has become a standard practice here, I challenge administration witnesses today to stay for the second panel and listen to the testimony that will be presented. I know that means you have to stay for the entire hearing uh, so, I, uh, so you can hear the testimony of witnesses other than the government officials, but I think it would be helpful. I think it would do some good for you to hear from the people who have experienced the devastation of losing someone to prescription drug abuse, to hear from one of the companies actually working to develop drug abuse resistant forms of pharmaceuticals, to hear from the organizations that are on the front lines working to educate doctors, patients and kids or partnering with the private industry to reduce prescription drug abuse. The second panel gives a face to the problem and present solutions. Our first panel today consists of Dr. Bertha Madras, Deputy Director for Demand Reduction at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, Dr. Uh, Sandra uh, Queter, uh, Deputy Director of the Office of New Drug Center for Drug Evaluation and Review at the Food and Drug Administration, uh, Mr. Joe Ran. Why does he say the Deputy Director Administrator for the Office of Diversion Control of the Do Drug Enforcement Administration and Dr. Nora Volkal, Director of the National Institute for Drug Abuse. Our second panel consists of Ms. Misty Fetko, a registered nurse who lost her 18-year-old son Carl to Robitussin and fentanyl abuse, Ms. Linda, Ms. Linda Sirks, who lost her 19-year-old son Jason to a prescription drug overdose-related uh, death, Barbara Van uh, Royen, uh, who lost her 24-year-old son, Patrick, to OxyContin use, Ms. Mathia Falco, President of Drug Strategies, Mr. Stephen Johnson, Executive Director of Commercial Planning with Pain Therapeutics Incorporated, uh, Dr. Uh, Laksamia Manachikanti, Chief Executive Officer of the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, and Mr. Steve Pasurab. President and CEO of the Partnership for Drug Free America. I welcome each of you and I look forward to your testimony. I yield to our ranking member, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I do uh, thank you for holding this hearing today. And uh, as you were speaking, I uh, could not help but uh, be reminded of uh, some many years ago when I was a uh, high school student working in a pharmacy in South Baltimore when people would come in to the neighborhood and buy high volumes of Robitussin. And even back then, 
it was a problem, and I shall never forget in 17 trying to figure out why would anybody want to come and buy 10 or 15 bottles of Robitussin in the middle of July. So this problem is not a new one. The abuse and illegal diversion of prescription drugs is not new. But due to a number of factors, it has been increasingly prevalent. A number of, si of uh, factors have been cited by the National Institute on Drug Abuse and others as contributing to the expansion of non-medical use of pharmaceuticals. These factors include the growing number of drugs being marketed to treat a seemingly ever-expanding list of treatable illnesses and conditions, increasingly easy access to pharmaceuticals by way of the Internet, including from online pharmacies that do not require a prescription and do not verify the identity of the buyers. The relatively low stigma associated with non-medical use of prescription drugs versus the use of illicit substances. And the common misperception that pharmaceutical drugs are not dangerous. As I've said many times, the person who improperly uses prescription drugs and abuse them is just as bad and puts themselves in just as much danger as a person who was sitting in a corner snorting cocaine. The fact is that any drug can be dangerous when used in the absence of appropriate medical evaluation, guidance and supervision. This is why NIDA's recent estimate that some 43 million Americans have used a prescription drug for non-medical purposes is so very, very disturbing. Moreover, the 2004 National Household Survey on Drugs and Health indicated that 6.3 million Americans 12 years of age or older reported current, current non-medical use of a prescription drug in 2003. Data suggests that the elderly young adults between the ages of 18 and 25, and young women between the ages of 12 and 17 may be particularly at risk. Recent trends of the abuse of DXM, an ingredient found in over-the-counter cough suppressant medicines, and fentanyl, another opioid, have also caused great concern. Reports indicate that the latter drug is used sometimes unknowingly in conjunction with heroin and it has been linked to numerous overdose deaths in cities across the country. Sadly, we will hear testimony from three mothers of sons whose lives were lost as a result of prescription drug abuse. They represent a tiny fraction of the universe of people who have lost loved ones to prescription drugs and their compelling testimony will help us to understand how this problem plays out in individual cases. Hopefully it will also serve as a stark warning to the public that abuse of prescription drugs is, in fact, dangerous. I think it's clear, Mr. Chairman, that the problem warrants a multifaceted response, and I'd like to see Congress and the administration pursue the following actions. And before I go into that list, I agree with you, uh, Chairman Souter, that so often we have motion, come motion, emotion, and no results. And then we come later on, 10 years from now, and we're still dealing with the same problems. More people have suffered, more have died, and more have abused these prescription drugs. And so in the light of trying to get something done and push this ball down the field, I would suggest that we enact legislation to require that every online purchase of a prescription drug involves a valid prescription and verification of the purchaser's identity, that we provide uh, federal funding to support prescription monitoring programs in the states, that we support and promote efforts to educate the public, the medical community and pharmacists about the risk of prescription drug abuse and diversion, 
Do we encourage efforts to develop drug formulations that are non-addictive and resistant to abuse? And that we encourage all parties involved in the drug supply chain and the consumer purchase transactions to take steps to prevent the illegal diversion of pharmaceutical products. Granted, some of these measures may, may be more complex than they may sound at first blush. The devil, as always, lies in the detail. But I'm confident that we can summon the will to overcome whatever obstacles there may be to moving forward on all these fronts. Certainly, today's hearing offers a valuable opportunity to hear recommendations from a variety of different viewpoints concerning how the Federal Government should approach these tasks. And as I close, Mr. Chairman, I cannot help but think about the many people that came into that South Baltimore drugstore, many of them a little older than I was back then, but many of them are dead. With that said, Mr. Chairman, I want to close by extending my deepest sympathies to our witnesses who have lost a child to prescription drug abuse and by applauding all of our witnesses for the work they are doing to address this issue. I think we can all agree that more must be done. The question is, is whether we will have the will and whether we will do it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and thank you. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record. Any answers to written questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record without objection. So ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that all exhibits, documents, and other materials referred to by members may be included in the hearing record, that all members be permitted to revise and extend their remarks without objection. It's so ordered. Under the House rules, um, we'll have to uh, adjourn for the uh, Iraqi Prime Minister. Our intention is to uh, get through the, the first panel, uh, and then we may have to suspend. If we uh, do not get into the second panel before uh, we need to suspend, I intend to uh, reconvene the hearing at 12 o'clock promptly, uh, which should give us time to have uh, completed the Prime Minister's address. With that, I thank each of the witnesses for coming, and we'll uh, first I need to swear everybody in. Uh, if you just uh, raise your right hand, we'll do it uh, sitting. Uh, it is our standard practice and as an oversight committee to swear in all of our witnesses. Uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony you give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I'll be God. Let the record show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. And we'll start with Dr. Madras. Thank you for coming today. <clears throat> Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to testify before you today regarding the abuse of prescription drugs. The abuse, sometimes called the non-medical use of pres prescription drugs, is a significant national problem. In sheer number of users, it is now America's number two drug problem, second only to marijuana. Last year, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health indicated more new initiates of non-medical prescription drug use than of marijuana. Opioid painkillers like oxycodone, stimulants like Ritalin, and sedative sleeping aids such as Ambien are examples of prescription drugs which are legal and beneficial when lawfully used as indicated. They nevertheless have potential for abuse and for addiction. The administration's response to this problem strives to balance two important policy concerns. First, that prescription drugs have strong medical benefits when used lawfully and in accordance with medical direction. Second, these same drugs can be harmful, even deadly, when abused, and the rate of abuse is growing rapidly. The administration has set an objective of reducing prescription drug abuse by 15 percent over the next three years. The synthetic drug control strategy released last month describes the administration's plan to accomplish this ambitious goal. To reduce the illicit supply of prescription drugs, traditional law enforcement and interdiction activities, including at our border, are important. An additional element for this class of drugs is regulatory. For example, the administration strongly supports state-run prescription drug monitoring programs, which seek to reduce doctor shopping, prescription fraud, and ultimately diversion opportunities through state-level regulation, 
designed to improve the sharing of prescription information between prescribers and dispensers. At the beginning of the President's term, there were approximately 15 of these programs. Now there are 33 states where a program exists or has been authorized, and the administration hopes to see a prescription drug monitoring program in every state by the end of the President's second term. The administration is also focused on reducing other avenues for diversion. Federal law enforcement targets both rogue internet pharmacies and the very small percentage of physicians who circumvent law and sound medical practice to provide controlled substances to individuals for non-medical reasons. Prevention and treatment are critical elements of our strategy. Public health messages, the identification of prescription drug abusers, and treatment capacity are major components of the synthetic strategy. The administration is concerned about the sharing of controlled prescription drugs amongst family and friends. Our strategy involves a partnership with the pharmaceutical and medical communities to educate Americans as to the importance of monitoring, disposing of un needed, unused medications. We are holding a medical education conference in December in which we are inviting the um, deans of, of major medical schools as well as medical state medical boards in order to educate them on this issue. The theme of this medical conference is in fact prescription drugs. We are also holding a conference this Friday on fentanyl in which we bring together a multidisciplinary task force of um, researchers, of policemen, medical examiners, and treatment providers to educate them in, in uh, the problem of fentanyl-associated deaths in Philadelphia which occurs in a state that has had a very high rate of fentanyl-associated deaths. The National Youth Anti-Drug Media Campaign launched an open letter ad in People magazine last Friday encouraging parents to be aware of the number of abusing prescriptions and other drugs. This letter to parents will run in numerous other publications in the near future, and a copy of it is on exhibit to the right of, of uh, in this room. Drug-Free Communities is working on prescription drugs and other educational and teaching materials in, in um, over 365 of these communities. Programs and initiatives which are not drug-specific are also important tools in reducing this public health problem. Random student drug testing can, testing can help screen young people for prescription drug abuse and offer positives appropriate counseling. The screening brief intervention referral to treatment program is a key component of expanding our capacity to identify, counsel, and refer to treatment persons with substance abuse disorders. It can identify a cohort of prescription drug abusers who enter hospital or clinical environments seeking treatment for reasons other than prescription drugs. Federally supported treatment programs such as the access to recovery and drug courts can help heal those addicted to prescription drugs. To achieve a 15 percent reduction in prescription drug abuse, we need to increase public awareness and collaboration with the medical community, the pharmaceutical community, of the risks associated with non-medical use of prescription drugs, and we have concrete plans to further this goal. Towards this end, I thank Congress for its support of both the President's National Drug Control Strategy and Synthetic Drug Control Strategy. Thank you, Dr. Volkoff. Uh, Dr. Volkoff, do you want to go ahead with the testimony? Good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Souther, Mr. Cummins, and other members of the committee. I, it is a privilege for me to be here to discuss the science behind, behind the abuse of prescription medication. We've heard uh, the problem is, is quite large. 6.3 million Americans abuse prescription medication. We've also heard that it surpassed, prescription medication surpassed in terms in 2004, the number of new initiates over that of marijuana. This is the first time it has happened. 
If you look at monitoring the future, we survey 8, 10, and 12 graders. A prescription medication, a prescription medication is number two, just preceded by marijuana. But number three, number four, number five, number six in terms of prevalence are also other prescription medications. So prescription medication abuse is widespread. What are the prescription drugs that are abused? There are three classes, uh, pain medications uh, that use opiates such as Oxycontin and Vicodin, which are typically used to treat severe or moderate pain. Stimulant medications such as amphetamine and Ritalin, which are typically used to treat attention deficit disorder. And sedative hypnotics such as benzodiazepines and barbiturates like Librium Valium, which are typically used to uh, treat sleeping disorders, anxiety, uh, muscle spasms. Why are they abused, these drugs? They are abused because like licit or illicit drugs like methamphetamine or cocaine, they increase the concentration of the chemical dopamine in reward areas of the brain. And indeed, they use the same targets uh, that some of these drugs do, drugs of abuse, for example, the illegal drugs. Um, Ritalin and amphetamine, the stimulants, use the same targets as cocaine and methamphetamine, respectively. For the opiates, oxycontin, vicodin, hydrocodone, use the same targets as morphine. And benzodiazepines use similar targets as alcohol. So the question is, why is the difference, what is the difference between these drugs being therapeutically effective and their potential of abuse? And what we've learned is that there are several factors, but there are two key factors. One of them is dose. When these drugs are abused, they are used at much larger doses, and they, the doses are taken much more frequently than when prescribed therapeutically. Another extraordinary important factor is the route of administration. When you take drugs therapeutically, these are given orally. When many of these drugs are abused, they are snorted or injected. And why is that so? Because what we've learned is for this type of drugs to be rewarding, they have to get into the brain very rapidly. And the route of administration affects the rate at which these drugs enter. When they are injected or snorted, they go into the brain much more rapidly when they, that then when they are taken orally. Who is at risk? Well, this is a non-discriminatory. It affects all ages, all genders, all socioeconomic classes. Um, it has faces, for example, for the first time with the abuse of opiates in young individuals, in adolescents, which usually in terms of opiates, heroin abusers are in their 20s and or their 30s. This is particularly problematic because the brain is still maturing. So at this stage, the abuse of these medications can affect the proper development of the brain, making these individuals more vulnerable to the addictive effects of other drugs into the future. What do we know about why is this happening now? And some of these factors have been mentioned. There has been a dramatic increase in the number of prescriptions for these medications. Take stimulants. The rate of prescriptions have basically doubled over every five years, over the past 15 years. The rate of production has escalated in parallel. There has been an increased advertisement of these substances through the media. We have now easy access through the internet. We have generated a culture that not only gives medications for the treatment of disease, but are starting to give medications to improve performance. And thus, the belief that it may be safe to take these prescription drugs because, as was mentioned before, they are approved by the FDA. Unfortunately, the gruesome reminder of the deaths from the use of this painkiller fentanyl, very potent, is a reminder that these drugs are very dangerous. So what is NIDA doing? NIDA has taken a multi-pronged approach to invest research into the basic neuroscience of what are these drugs doing to the brain? What are the genes that make a person more vulnerable? What is the epidemiology? In parallel, we're also developing medications that can be potent analgesics without having the rewarding properties. We're developing new, new, new ways of delivering it so that they can minimize its abuse. At the same time, we're developing treatments to actually deal with the problem of the person that's addicted to prescription medication and to target those individuals that need the medication but become addicted. 
Finally, we realize the importance of education and we've partnered with ONDCP, with SAMHSA, and with medical community, professional communities to educate both the clinicians as well as the public about just the therapeutic value of these medications, but also the importance of proper uh, surveillance. I thank the committee. This is a, a, a problem that has not been given the attention that it deserves. It is urgent, and uh, it's a privilege for me to be able to share with you how science can help with it. Thank you. Dr. Creter? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Sandra Queter. I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of New Drugs in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our drug approval process and its interface with our role in preventing prescription drug abuse. FDA is a public health agency that's strongly committed to promoting and protecting the public health by assuring that safe and effective products reach the market in a timely way and that the products are marketed for continued safety once out there. FDA is aware of and is concerned about reports of and the reality of prescription drug abuse, misuse, and diversion. We're aware of data showing that abuse of prescription drugs, including narcotics, is growing. This is a serious issue, and we sympathize with the families and friends of individuals who've lost their lives or otherwise have been harmed as a result of prescription drug abuse and misuse. We have them too. While addressing the important issues of drug abuse and misuse, FDA must assure that patients who require these medicines maintain appropriate access to them through informed providers and safeguards. Under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, FDA is responsible for ensuring that new drugs are safe and effective. Before any drug is approved for marketing in the United States, FDA must decide whether the studies and information submitted by the drug sponsor have demonstrated that the drug is safe and effective when used according to the drug's labeling. When the drug's benefits outweigh the risks and the labeling instructions and some certain other measures allow for safe and effective use by patients, FDA approves the drug for marketing. Let me say a little bit more about what I mean by other measures. At the time of approval, and sometimes after approval, FDA may develop, in cooperation with a drug sponsor, a plan of interventions beyond labeling to help assure the safe and effective use of the drug. This has been referred to as risk management plans or risk maps, but the practice dates back many years. Interventions that might make up a risk management plan vary, but all are aimed at assuring that known or potential issues regarding proper use of the drug are addressed by prescribers and patients. The agency's general expectation for, for developing risk maps, including aspects that might include post-marketing surveillance and other strategies, are detailed in a set of guidances that we published in March 2005 as a response to reauthorization of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. The provisions of the Controlled Substances Act are a means of actually managing risk of drugs, although they predate this term of risk management plan or risk map. Under the CSA, we at FDA notify the DEA if a new drug application is submitted for any drug having a stimulant, depressant, or hallucinogenic effect on the central nervous system. That would certainly include opiates, because it's assumed that the drug may have abuse potential. For such drugs, the product's developer or sponsor must provide FDA with all data pertinent to abuse of the drug, a proposal for scheduling under the CSA, and data on overdoses. We then recommend a scheduling category, but DEA makes the finally, final scheduling category decision. In addition to scheduling, it's common though, for products with abuse potential to have risk maps that establish interventions to actually prevent misuse, abuse, and overdose. Specifically, FDA expects sponsors of applications for any new drug with abuse potential to submit a risk map to address three important areas. Preventing accidental overdose, ensuring proper patient selection for prescription, and preventing misuse and abuse. And we review those, pro those proposals very carefully. 
While individual programs will vary based on product-specific considerations, every risk map for drugs of, with abuse potential should address those three elements and contain monitoring plans above and beyond the usual for side effects, specifically to identify misuse, overdose, abuse, or potential, and potential for aver, uh, diversion. Examples might include specialized training for providers, call centers or websites for reporting problems or obtaining advice, single source distribution, kits for patients to ensure safe storage and disposal, limited marketing rollout plans, targeted surveillance activities to detect excessive prescribing or, pres or prescription diversion, or, and additional studies to address development of novel formulations. Our job is not over after approval. We work diligently to assure that these programs are adhered to and changed if necessary. We monitor our own adverse reactions reporting system for signals of side effects that, that might suggest abuse or misuse. And we also utilize the DAWN system through, that SAMHSA operates to continually reassess drug risks in the area of abuse. We do collaborate with, other, with the DEA and other agencies. We meet regularly to, prevent, divert, to work on projects to prevent diversion, develop programs to, to, for physician education, collaborate with state prescription mon drug monitoring programs and other task forces. We recognize the serious problem of prescription drug abuse and we are taking steps to address this serious problem. In conclusion, we share the subcommittee's interest and concerns regarding prescription drug abuse, and I'll be happy to answer further questions. Thank you. Mr. Anazisi. Chairman Souter, Ranking Mem Member Cummings, on behalf of Administrator Karen P. Tandy and the Drug Enforcement Administration, I appreciate your invitation to testify today regarding DEA's efforts to address the issue of prescription drug abuse. Addressing the growing problem of diversion and abuse of controlled pharmaceuticals continues to be one of the top priorities of the Drug Enforcement Administration. DEA has not remained idle in response to this growing threat. DEA has significantly increased the amount of resources and manpower dedicated to investigating the diversion of controlled subst substances particularly pharmaceuticals. We continue to focus our drug enforcement efforts on the most significant diverters in the drug supply chain. An illustration of the administration's focus on this problem occurred on June 1, 2006, when the Department of Justice, along with DEA, ONDCP, DHS, and HHS, announced the release of the Synthetic Drug Control Strategy, which, among other threats, specifically targets prescription drug abuse. The DEA is keenly aware of this problem, and as outlined in that strategy, we have committed an ambitious goal of reducing the abuse of controlled pharmaceuticals by 15 percent over the next three years. In developing a strategy to attack this problem, it's important to understand that there are distinct differences between drugs such as heroin, marijuana, and controlled pharmaceuticals. Typical drug control strategies used to attack organizations that focus on distribution of clandestine drugs do not necessarily lend themselves to attacking those organizations that legally traffic in controlled pharmaceuticals. Distribution channels that are otherwise legal are often manipulated to acquire controlled substance prescription drugs for illegal purposes. Compounding this matter is the perception, particularly among teenagers and young adults, that controlled pharmaceuticals are safe even when used recreationally. The most common methods of diversion witnessed are through doctor shopping, prescription fraud, improper prescribing, and sharing among family and friends. Perhaps the largest growing method for controlled substance, however, diversion of controlled substances, is the Internet. Looking at perhaps the most potentially dangerous and increasingly used method for diversion of controlled substances, the Internet, we've discovered that many of these online pharmacies do not operate in the same manner as brick and mortar pharmacies. This includes advertising controlled substances for sale without a prescription and not requiring an in-person medical examination by a licensed physician. There are strong societal benefits to allowing individuals with a valid prescription to get their prescriptions over the Internet, as long as the pharmacy that fills the prescription is, a legitimate, is legitimate and there exists a legitimate doctor-patient relationship. There are legitimate pharmacies that provide services over the Internet and that operate well within the bounds of both law and sound medical practice. However, what's particularly troubling is the idea that a minor can easily log on to an illicit website provide an inaccurate age, and have a controlled substance delivered directly to their door. 
no special DEA registration is currently required to market control substances online, but the tangible aspects of manufacturing, distributing, prescribing, and dispensing pharmaceutical control substances remain squarely under the jurisdiction of the Controlled Substances Act. Any legitimate transaction over the Internet must comply with these existing laws. Additional clarification of the roles and responsibilities for professionals seeking to use the Internet to meet the needs of clients would not only allow us to more readily identify legitimate online pharmacies and persons operating and promoting them, but it would also assist in gathering information pointing to abuse patterns. In addition, there exists no statutory definition of a valid doctor-patient relationship. Finally, the penalties associated with the illegal sale of Schedule 3 through 5 substances, which are those most commonly sold over the Internet, are not as significant as may be warranted. Finally, it's important to consider DEA's obligation under the law and to the public, which is to ensure that pharmaceutical control substances are prescribed and dispensed only for a legitimate medical purpose and in accordance with the CSA. Understanding the differences and the similarities between prescription drugs and controlled substances is an important aspect of evaluating the causes and possible policy solutions regarding the rise in prescription drug abuse. In conclusion, the diversion of pharmaceutical control substances continues to be a significant challenge. Nevertheless, the DEA is committed to using the necessary tools at its disposal to fight this problem on all fronts while simultaneously ensuring an uninterrupted supply of pharmaceutical control substances for legitimate demands. Chairman Sauer and Ranking Member Cummings, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Uh, let me ask a uh, basic question first. Uh, maybe if Dr. Volkov, maybe Mr. NCC would know the answer to this question. Uh, in the um, uh, overdose misuse uh, categories in particular, uh, do we know how many of these people are actually have a legitimate prescription and then move on to abusing it as opposed to just starting into abuse? No, that information, uh, to my knowledge, is not accessible. One of the problems that happens in emergency rooms where is where you are recording these numbers is that, in general, the, I mean, an individual that comes in with an overdose may not necessarily state that this was for diversion purposes, and uh, the physicians many times, and they won't, they won't want to admit it, so the physicians don't even have the information about what may be wrong with that uh, particular individual. So the numbers are not clear in terms of what percentage constitutes diversion versus proper medication. It is likely that most, in most cases it will come from diversion because if you are properly prescribing the medications, there are guidelines about how to instruct the patients to ensure that they will take it safely. However, there is a subgroup where that is at higher risk and that's elderly individuals which may forget that they've taken their medication or on the other hand, may be taking multiple medications and then combine them in inappropriate ways. So that's the, the subgroup that is at risk for developing medical complications even when properly prescribed. But otherwise, I would predict even though the numbers are not there, just on the, the standard practices of medicine that um, when used properly, these medications are quite safe. Because it, that defines our problem substantially different when you make certain assumptions. I, I mean, if you have small percentage might decide to self-medicate that their addiction, you know, that the treatment wasn't enough. You have the seniors that you mentioned may be that case. Uh, but um, it, it uh, leads to a whole different type of a strategy depending on that data. And I would think gathering that data becomes fairly critical here. If nothing else, uh, kind of doing a post-analysis of people out of the emergency rooms to try to figure out whether they were, um, uh, in fact, had legal prescriptions and, and where they got it, because that would seem such a basic piece of information if, it, in my background's business and MBA, I mean, that's how you'd approach it. You'd say, what's my target group, then try to figure out where it came from. Another uh, related question to that is, my understanding, to Volkov, what you said was is that uh, one of the big reasons people do this is the way they uh, they need to inhale it into to inhale it to get it into their brain faster that suggests suggested to me that if you're doing that uh, that probably you weren't 
using it for, uh, you didn't start with that as a legitimate pain medication uh, because that sounded more like a recreational uh, use uh, question uh, or perceived recreational use question. And that means that the market and the strategy, whether it's uh, a treatment question, a, pre a prevention question, a youth education question, a law enforcement question is substantially different here because we have people who really don't want to know how to use it. Therefore, uh, my guess is, for example, ONDCP announcing a conference that they're going to pull all the manufacturers together may be, in fact, irrelevant uh, because they already know the dangers of the problem. The, the question is, how do you, uh, uh, in this at-risk market, reach them? Uh, now, let me a ask a uh, fundamental question of, of Dr. Queter. Um, can, can I, can I ask, answer you just one point? Because I want you to be aware of it. This was something that shocked me when I first heard about it, which is I wanted exactly the same numbers. What are the numbers on the emergency rooms that are accounting for overdoses? I wanted those numbers badly. We couldn't get them. Part of the problem is that many states, most of the states in the emergency room, if someone comes in with an illegal substance that they have taken for illegal purposes, the insurance will not reimburse. So you as a physician that wants to treat that particular individual, you may not necessarily want to ask the question because you, you as a physician need to take care of that individual. So the rules themselves that we currently have in emergency room do not necessarily help to be able to get an idea of the problem. Um, Dr. Queter, uh, that one of the requirements I mentioned in my opening statement was from the Appropriations Committee that uh, you look at the abuse-resistant formula of prescription drugs. Do you believe you have the authority to grant priority review for these projects, products, and has it uh, considered request to do so, and if so, have you granted priority review for any of the types of products that, in fact, would make them more abuse resistant? Mr. Chairman, I, the abuse resistant, a, a product that came in with a formulation that appeared to have any potential to mitigate abuse potential would be something that we would consider under uh, appropriate for a priority review. I, on, I don't know off the top of my head which products we have granted such review for, but I can provide that information. But do you believe you have granted some? I believe that we have. Okay, that, uh, we'd appreciate that uh, soon for the record. Mr. Anazisi, uh, in the uh, DEA uh, has said in your publication that you're working closely with FDA for rapid reformulation of OxyContin. We've asked uh, DEA about these statements in the past, and DEA hasn't provided us with any material response. I'm asking you again specifically, uh, how have you worked closely with the FDA to urge this, and what do you have to show for your efforts of reformulation of OxyContin? I can't specifically comment on OxyContin. Uh, I can tell you that we work very closely with FDA on, on all different issues regarding scheduling and new drugs. Uh, the, uh, our scientists are continually in contact with them on, on all different matters concerning the scheduling or new drug approval process. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, we have a special testing lab uh, in, uh, in Virginia that, that would be able to take these formulations and look at them and, and, and see if we could leach or, or remove the, the final product from the tablets, and we've offered that to pharmaceutical companies in the past. Um, you know, abuse resistance, we, we could make a determination in our labs if the product could be removed uh, easily or, or difficulty, and that information could be passed on to the FDA. Uh, and again, that was offered to the companies. We do work closely with FDA when it comes to that. We have to because that's how we come up with what schedule the drug's going to be put into and how it's going to be scheduled. Here's what my frustration is, is mentioned in the opening statement that of the 6 million people abusing prescription drugs, 4.4 million were pain relievers, such as OxyContin. OxyContin in particular among youth is showing up 40%. Uh, in the, uh, uh, the action plan to prevent the diversion and abuse of OxyContin, it says, DEA continues to work closely with the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, in strongly urging rapid, rapid reformulation of OxyContin to the extent that it is technically possible in order to reduce the abuse of this uh, product, particularly by injection. And the question is, since this is uh, 
been testifying at this under oath in your action plans and so on, what are you doing? I mean, oxycotton is the major pressure point. Uh, is anything happening? Well, the key statement is to the extent that's technically possible. The Drug Enforcement Administration does not dictate how a company is going to formulate or, or reformulate. But I ask a we more particular question. It says, you said, the agency, DEA continues to work closely with FDA and strongly urging the rapid reformulation of OxyContin. What I asked my original question was, what action points have you had with FDA and the contacts to work with OxyContin? Not did they find it. Did you ask them to find it? Do you have memos you showed them to ask them to find it? Has there been a task force working group to do it? Have you pulled it in? Have they found, tried to reformulate two or three times and it didn't work? Is anybody doing anything? I'll have to get back to you on that, sir. I can't answer the specific What's in your question that you're regarding already doing OxyContin. It. But, but you already said you were doing it in the testimony before and in your action plans. Uh, that's where well, this is the major hearing. It's not like you got ten hearings on this, this subject. Uh, it, it's not like this is a huge shock that this question might come up. That's the frustration. Uh, as you know, I've been a major supporter of DEA. I remain a major supporter of DEA. But this type of thing is, is frustrating. You can't just make assertions and action plans that you're doing something. Then when you have your big hearing, that usually what happens is everybody scrambles after a two-year request to get it, and when the hearing finally comes, we get an answer. And usually I'm complaining that the answer came one hour before the hearing. In this case, it still isn't here. And that's, that's what's frustrating. This, this, it's not like OxyContin. Fentanyl is kind of a new one popping up on us in this, this, and we're trying to get on fentanyl. But on OxyContin, it's not like we haven't had a warning. I mean, pharmacies are being robbed in my district. They have been for a long time and all over the country. And we're saying, well, we'll, we'll check out and see if we've done anything. That's what basically my answer was. Chairman Souter, I just wonder if, <clears throat> if I can um, march in here for a moment. There is a manuscript that was published just a few weeks ago by a, uh, a Dr. Cohn on trying to, trying to define what are the problems of formulations. And what he quotes is the number of internet sites that teach, instruct people how to circumvent effective formulations. And for OxyContin, there are two or three mechanisms that the internet tells potential users how to get around these. And the, I, I, I do accept the, the, your view that this is a, a, a very significant problem, but I, I think the pharmaceutical companies, which take years and years to develop new formulations, are trying to catch up to some of these strategies. And I think we have to... You're telling me that multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical companies, some of which happen to be in my home state, and I'm yes. very proud of them, with all their buildings of researchers that kids and people can come up with multi-reformulations and so they should just kind of say, well, tough luck, kids are dying. Uh, that's there's, not... There's, <laughs> that, that, well, that's kind of what you said, that, that, they, that, that uh, I haven't had, and, the, and quite frankly, the idea that the federal government's big response here is that they read an article uh, about the difficulty of reformulations doesn't explain, are they trying? Have you asked them? What have they done? Uh, that uh, Are you pushing them? Have they tried some reformulations and then shown on the internet that they can get around those reformulations? Uh, th that's what my question is. What actions have you done? Not did you read an article, not did you wring your hands. Uh, I understand it's difficult, and th many types of things. When we do something on the border, then people try to get around it. When we, when we try to stop a trafficking of, of Internet, then people are going to come up with a, that's the business of, of crime, is to try to figure out how. The question is, do we just say, oh, well, I guess they're going to get around anything we do, so let's just keep doing the way we've been doing. That is not, not, not. Uh, so what are we doing? Well, our, our goal is to develop a, a consortium. Pardon? To have a conference. No. A conference, from my vantage, requires an action plan. And our, from our vantage, what we are going to do is have a consortium of pharmaceutical industries come together. SAMHSA organized this a week ago, and ONDCP has an intention to do this as well, but without simply talking and devising strategies 
in order to circumvent some of these obvious problems. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Volkow, tell me something. <clears throat> you think we have an epidemic here? I think. I can't hear you. I, I, I mean, people get caught up with the term epidemic, but I would use the term in this one. And I think, it, as you mentioned, it is not a new one. What is new is the dramatic increases that we're seeing, particularly on the opiate analgesics. Mm -hmm. You said something that uh, kind of struck me when you were testifying. You were talking about the parts of the brain that are affected um, by, I guess, overdosage of these uh, prescription drugs. and. Um, I, you know, I couldn't help, and as I listened to Chairman Souter, I could not help but wonder about how powerful uh, these uh, combinations are, this overdosage is. And the reason why that's so significant to me is because thousands, literally thousands upon thousands of inner city folks in my district are sitting in jail for uh, having possession of <clears throat> or distributing things that I guess would be just as powerful as some of these combinations. And it's interesting because, you know, Mr. Sauter, Chairman Sauter said it, I said it, and I think all of us said it. There's no stigma attached to this. The housewife who picks up the kids after school from the private school, then dashes off to the ball in the evening. Uh, when it's found that she's taking these dosages of Oxycontin, for example, there is no real, I mean, a stigma compared to the person who's shooting up dope in the alley in Baltimore. He goes to jail. People just say, poor little Amy. And I guess what I'm trying to get to is, is there the combinations of drugs, the things that we're talking about, are they just as powerful or can they be just as powerful as the drugs like crack cocaine, heroin, uh, methamphetamines, you know, as, as far as damage to the body well, and mind? A very challenging question. And, um when used properly, these drugs that the prescribes doses and for the purpose intended, these drugs are safe and very beneficial. They can save people's lives. When they are abused, however, they are utilized in very different uh, circumstances. Some of these drugs can be as damaging in terms of their addiction potential as illegal substances. We've all heard about Oxycontin. We've all heard about fentanyl. Fentanyl is an incredibly potent opiate. It can produce addiction um, in no difference from that of heroin. In terms of its medical consequences of overdose, it is as dangerous, if not more dangerous, because you have a, even a more potent drug. So yes, these drugs, pharmacologically, when they are diverted and injected and used at inappropriate doses, pharmacologically, you cannot say this is worse than the other one. Mm -hmm. In some instances, Yes, there are drugs that are less potent, but some of these drugs can be as potent as the others. And that's where the question comes around about why is it? I mean, one of the, the important issues, though, what we are observing, which is very challenging, is we have people that even when properly prescribed some of these medications for pain, and, and the numbers exactly are, we don't know precisely, but it's between 5 and 7 percent of those people properly prescribed pain medications will become addicted, even though they are taking it orally, followed by a physician. We are trying to understand why. Why is it that in these individuals the chronic use of these drugs produces the plastic changes in the brain that lead to the process of addiction? And but we don't know yet. But you're not, you're not talking, you're talking, you said 7%, is that what you said? 5 to 7%, approximately. We do not know exactly. I'm being very conservative, 5 to 7%. And that's one group. But that leaves us 93% of others, is that right? If I'm doing my math right. No, I'm, I'm in, the, I'm, I took a... Well, I know, you, you said there's a group. There is a group that may take these drugs properly and may become addicted. 
There are others who go out and make a choice. Absolutely. They make a choice to use these drugs the way they are not supposed to be used. And you know, and I can understand Chairman Siler's frustration because basically what we have is a group of people who make a choice to do this and they then can, in many instances, just let me finish, skirt the law while that other person who goes and shoots up crack cocaine or heroin can go to prison but yet and still they're just as dangerous. One is just as dangerous as the other. You, you are absolutely right. Uh, there, as I say, there is no justification of uh, in an individual that chooses to take that drug for diversion in this instance to differentiate it from other drugs. However, I do not believe on stigmatizing the drug addicted individual, whether it is a heroin addict or whether it's an Oxycontin addict. I think that basically what I believe is important is to recognize this as a disease where the individual, because of the effects of drugs, has uh, led to changes that affect their behavior. And that's, so I do not see a justification for stigmatizing that person that's addicted to heroin, as I don't see a justification for stigmatizing OxyContin. But the fact is, is that in this country, Correct. in this country, if a dope addict came in here right now on heroin, nodding, saliva dripping from his face, as I've seen in my district, that person is stigmatized as a bad person. I'm just telling you, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And so now the question becomes is, I, be I do believe that education is so significant in, in this because I think maybe a lot of times people don't even realize what we just talked about. How, I mean, they think, well, I'll do a little here, a little something here, and I'll add it this, and I'll get this buzz and a lot of times may not even realize the, the full impact of what is happening to them. I mean, what do you see as the most practical solutions? Now, considering, considering what I said in my testimony, that I was, dealing, I was looking at this problem as a 17-year-old. I'm 55 now. And, let's, and being realistic of what this government will or will not do. I mean, what we in the Congress, it's our job, as you well know, is try to make policy to help protect the citizens of this country, I mean, what would you have us do that you know is practical and that you know uh, can happen before we go to dance with the angels? Well, to start with, I was delighted that you organized this hearing. It's not that I need more work, but I've been actually uh, very proactive to try to make people aware of the importance of this problem that, to my view, is not recognized to the extent of the impact. So I've personally spoke with Dr. Andy von Eschenbach when he took the direction of the FDA to alert him about it. I've personally spoken with Dr. Serhuni at the NIH to alert him about it. I've especially spoken with the Surgeon General to alert him about it and my concern. So the notion of educating the different agencies is extraordinarily important. What you are doing by initiating this here is a very good beginning. In the process, we've also been coordinating. This is, this is something that we're not, again, going to say the same thing. We're not tackling one agency by themselves. One agency cannot solve it. It really needs the consorted effort of the multiple agencies. And it does need the consorted effort of partnership with the private industry. Because it's at the end in their ultimate interest. They don't want their OxyContin labeled as something that is negative. It's bad for their reputation. So taking advantage of that to bring them into the process. I think it's, it's, it's really is going to take, again, a systematic, multi-pronged approach where as we develop science, as we develop programs for, which are in the FDA and the DA for regulating, you, have, you, you take the leadership position that bring this to the fore and said, we cannot ignore it. We need to address it. And we need to address it. And we need um, achievables within certain time, time frames. Mm -hmm. uh, in the light of time, Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, yield back. Uh, is this, uh, is abuse of prescription drugs disproportionately Anglo compared to uh, other heroin, cocaine, and so on? Yes, indeed, and I was mentioning that in terms of monitoring the future because when I saw the numbers, it's, it's very telling. You have number one, 33% of kids uh, abusing uh, marijuana. 
Number two is uh, Vicodin, 9.5 percent. Number three is amphetamine, 8.5 percent. Number four is, um, I don't, I, I think it's another opiate or a benzodiazepine. Number five is Oxycontin at 4.5 percent. And then you have seven uh, inhalants and eight cocaine and then nine, nine and other prescription medications. So they are overwhelming our youth. And again, the notion of exposure to these drugs, which are very potent, and in this case, most of our youth are taking them not because they medically need it, but because of diversion situation, is particularly a vulnerable period because it induces, it can interfere with the normal development. And what we know, it does make early exposure to drugs, it makes the, the risk for addiction much greater, not just for the substance that they are taking it, but for a wide variety of other compounds. So it's a very vulnerable period. So, so yes, those, those are the numbers. Ms. Watson. I want to thank the chairman for his responsible behavior, because I see this as an oversight, and we don't do enough of this kind of oversight in Congress. And I want to thank uh, all of the witnesses here. Uh, Dr. Volkov, since you seem to be the person that uh, we're targeting to give us some answers, you know, as I've been listening to your testimony, I'm thinking we always are dealing after the fact. And I don't hear enough in the front end about prevention. Uh, as I was reading the brochure on Jason Sirks, uh, he went on the internet and he was researching all these different new medications and thought that he could use them without risk. Now there's a Memorial Prevention Resource Center named after him. The question is, what can we do to prevent young people from looking outside of themselves to get a buzz on? Should we do it through our schools or should we get our courts? You know, we throw people into jail when we figure they're drug users, drug sellers. And we're not doing a thing to rehabilitate. In fact, lockups don't rehabilitate. But should we maybe throughout our country and your departments that are represented here, maybe have walk-in drug abuse centers, both prescriptive drugs and over-the-counter drugs? Uh, should we require uh, across the educational spectrum, since it's the only mandatory program in this country, that we do a lot, starting with K and going up the scale, to talk about the effect of using these drugs on body functions and brain development. And I'm really concerned about, I have a degree in school psychology in my other life. And uh, I saw the effects of drugs on children. I tested them. And the result is poor performance in school and pretty soon dropout. So where do we go from here? And any of you that have information, insight, or vision, please respond. Yeah, and I am a strong believer on uh, the importance of prevention to tackle the problem of substance abuse and addiction. In fact, it's our number one priority. Um, so, we, so, and we've been doing uh, research on prevention for many years. What we've learned is, yes, indeed, the educational system is an extraordinary opportunity to uh, touch uh, children and adolescents at uh, different stages during their life about the importance of, uh, about the knowledge about what drugs can do, but also teach them the skills that will enable them to behaviorally be able to say no when they are in a peer pressure situation and offer the drugs. And these programs have been shown to work. At the same time, we've come to recognize that in the aspect of prevention, again, we need a multi-pronged approach, and we should not just rely on the educational system, even though it is very e effective. We also need to involve the parents. We also need to involve the medical community. As bizarre as it may sound to you, because it sounds very bizarre to me when I first heard about it, 
Um, pediatricians don't necessarily evaluate kids for abuse of substances. So the medical community, which could play a very important role in the early detection of these and abuse of these substances, is not doing it. So th this is, this is the, the issue of preventing drug use is a responsibility at multiple levels that definitely should take advantage of the education system, but also should alert, should involve the families and the medical community into it. I'd like to add to that. Um, there, as, as Dr. Volko said, there are multiple manners in which we can educate young people through schools, Student drug testing is an effective way, and we've been advocating and promoting this program because it can, it can provide children with an excuse for not using drugs. Secondly, it can identify children who are using drugs and, and steer them into counseling and into treatment if necessary. <clears throat> the second issue, as Dr. Volko said, is parents, and our media campaign is targeting parents particularly and specifically with regard to prescription drugs, because we are aware that parents have the number one influence on children's drug behavior. The third issue, which we are dealing with now, with regard to our medical conference that I, I would like to just add a, 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 some, some more detail, is that we are profoundly concerned that the majority of medical schools in this country, the majority of residency training programs in this country, do not teach physicians how to screen for drugs, how to screen for adolescent drug use, and what to do once they screen for it. So we have a two-pronged approach to trying to solve this very significant void in medical education. Number one, is to try to enlist medical schools to develop these programs. And one of the ways in which we can enlist medical schools to develop these programs is to work towards reimbursing physicians for the screening. The second issue is we are supporting programs throughout the country uh, in, in uh, 14 states to conduct brief screening and interventions in trauma centers and emergency rooms, as well as colleges. And we think that this program is an effective mechanism for catching people who are using drugs and will be identified by the medical community. What is striking about the data that has emerged from SAMHSA is that the number of people who are addicted who do not feel they have a problem is a vast majority. It's estimated between 70 and 90 percent of people addicted do not come forward because they don't feel they have a problem. And by screening people within the medical community, and most Americans, more than 80 percent, see a physician at least once every two years, by screening people in the medical community, we will be able to identify and intervene and support treatment for them. I think that this is one of the great voids that we can fill that the administration and my office is working very, very, very significantly towards. Thank you. Uh, this question goes to Dr. Quader. Is that correct pronunciation? All right. Uh, you're the Deputy Director of the Office of New Drugs, Food, and Drug Administration. How about having a uh, engagement from the pharmaceutical manufacturers? A certain, when they put out a new drug that has the potential of becoming an addictive kind or has ingredients that uh, the person using uh, would become addicted to, and there appears to be something in the American psyche that leads them to using uh, drugs, uh, you know, you can't turn on your television, your radio, that uh, they're not hawking something, you know, if you want to go to sleep, if you want to wake up, if you want to stay awake, if you want to feel good, take this. So it goes into our psyche. 
But how about talking to the pharmaceutical uh, companies about having the fund that uh, the more profit they make, the more they add to that fund? Because I hear that um, after 9-11, uh, the profits were astronomical, uh, the pharmaceutical manufacturers. Uh, this fund then would support these walk-in counseling centers that wouldn't cost the consumer anything. But I would think that the courts could direct people to those counseling centers rather than to lockups. And uh, would you see the pharmaceutical manufacturers engaging in that kind of thing? The, it's um, not a tax. <laughs> um, that was your. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the kinds of things that we, we have not specifically explored that as an option. Um, we ha what we have done is we have looked at, when, when we evaluate drugs that have the potential for abuse, um, we look at each one uniquely to try and uh, ensure that the company is involved in activities that will do everything possible to prevent diversion, to present, prevent overdose to prevent abuse, and we might use all kinds of measures. Those might include limited marketing rollouts, for example, to prevent that. Um, they might include uh, specific kinds of safety measures or distribution systems that would prevent specific diversion. For example, the only way for a hospital to obtain a product would be directly from the company without a middle, without a middle wholesaler or distributor. Uh, we have not specifically explored with them a, a, a collaboration across companies mm -hmm. to um, have some sort of a fund. Um, I think another area that we might explore is how companies can collaborate to uh, look at tamper resistant um, tamper-resistant formulations, although we have participated in meetings and conferences sponsored by the industry and, the far and by academia to do those things. We have an example, uh, a recent approval that was well lauded in the press of where several companies got together to be able to produce a formulation that would allow once a day administration of three drugs to treat HIV. These are three drugs that have been on the market by different companies for over 10 years. Putting those together in one pill once a day was a monumental effort, and it required all of the resources of three very large pharmaceutical companies. But they did it because they saw that there was an interest, and it's a huge public health benefit. Those are the kinds of things, some of the collaborations that we've been involved with, with um, ONDCP, NIDA, and SAMHSA can produce. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and I, this is my last comment if I have a, another okay, minute. I, I, we have to adjourn in 10 minutes. Okay. So, uh, can, Let me can just I, close it out. This box passed over so I could go to you. If, if you could just make a brief comment. Yeah. I just want to say that uh, if you could approach the pharmaceutical manufacturers, and I notice now when they're talking about a particular over-the-counter or a new prescriptive drug, they do give the side effects, but it's always at the last, at the end, and uh, very quickly and very softly do they tell you the side effects. Maybe if we play up the effect of this medication on one system, uh, it might really garner the kind of attention. And thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman. And then I think uh, uh, Dr. Weider has a response. Yes. Th and actually, thank you for saying that. We actually are doing that. We have just implemented an, a new regulation that completely changes the format of how information is presented both to patients and providers so that the risk information, the key information is right up front. In recent approvals that we've had of drugs that have the potential for abuse, we have also included in labels the kinds of information about how to screen patients for evidence that the drug may be being abused and how to address that once it is detected, something that is really a departure from um, tradition and I think is a real step forward. 
it, which is all nice, except that our testimony said that the people we're talking about here aren't uh, uh, mostly abusers uh, of, of prescriptions. They're people who are getting the drug illegally, so it's not a matter so much of educating the doctors, of pharmaceutical companies giving us one more form to read when they give us a prescription. We have a whole different problem here. I'm not saying that's not nice, it's just not the major problem we're addressing. Uh, Ms. Fox? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, you've led very nicely into uh, the comment that I wanted to make and the question I wanted to ask. Um, I, I am very troubled by Dr. Uh, Volko's comments that you do not want to stigmatize anyone who is a drug abuser. And yet you're saying that 70 to 90 percent of the people who are addicted to drugs don't feel like they have a problem. And we want to spend a lot of time educating young people about the problems of drug abuse. It seems to me that you will never, ever get people to believe that there is a drug problem if you don't stigmatize drug abuse. And I cannot understand how you can say that it is wrong to stigmatize people who abuse drugs. And if you're the leader of our program, then what is that saying to, to the people who are trying to stop people from becoming drug abusers? And I'd like to have a reaction to that. And then I'd also like to know, do we have some sort of composite study that's been done, I understand that there has been, that compares programs that focus on personal responsibility, such as the uh, AA 12-step process, and all these other programs that just say to people, it's okay if you're a drug abuser. So tell me what the results are in terms of getting people off of, uh, uh, stop getting people to stop being drug abusers with those two programs, one that, that, res that promotes personal responsibility and the other that says it's perfectly all right for you to be a drug abuser. Yeah, and let me give you an explanation about why I don't think, uh, I do not believe in stigmatization of the person that's addicted to drugs. I've been treated drug addicted people for the past 25 years of my life. Never have I encountered a drug addicted person that wanted to be addicted. The consequences of addiction to the person are devastating, including suicide, loss of custody of children, um, incarceration. I asked the individuals, what are you taking the drug? Doc, I don't even know. It's no longer pleasurable. I just cannot control it. Drug addiction is the result of changes in the brain of the person that erode, that erode their ability to exert control. As a result of that, even though they cognitively know that they shouldn't take the drug, they don't want to take it. 24 hours later, after being released from prison, five years, no drugs, thereby taking it. It's no longer a choice the way that we see it. What is the problem of stigmatizing? No, no one would say it's good to be a drug addict, continue doing it. What we are saying is it's a disease and it needs to be treated and you need to take responsibility of this disease. So by labeling it as a medical disorder, we're not saying to the person it's okay. We're not removing the responsibility. We're changing the framework. We're again, highlighting the importance of treatment, both that that person needs help and that person needs to take responsibility of that treatment. As for your question, uh, how effective are treatments? Treatments, um, are, uh, drug addiction can be treated, and some of the programs that you mentioned that, that use 12 step pace, uh, like the Alcoholic and Anonymous, are very beneficial for many drug addicted people. They are not uh, the panacea, not everybody responds to it. The other thing about drug addiction as a disease, it's a chronic disease, which means that treatment would need to be continuous, that you cannot just discontinue and expect a cure. So there has to be some level of therapeutic alliance. So that's why, on the other hand, stigmatizing, what's the problem of stigmatizing? The problem of stigmatizing is that the person that's addicted to drugs is much less likely to recognize and to admit and to stand up and say, I need help, because no one likes to be stigmatized. So yes, we have 85 or 90 percent of people that are addicted that are not seeking treatment. Part of the problem is that the stigmatization can be extraordinarily difficult to overcome 
if you're an addicted person and requires treatment. So we are not helping anyone by stigmatizing. Vis-a-vis -vis prevention, what we need, we need to educate children and adolescents and the general population about the dangers of drugs, the devastating consequences that drugs can have. That's, in my view, what will make the change. We did it with smoking in this country. We brought down smoking by 50%. The moment we recognized and we mounted a multi-pronged approach to say we cannot afford this, this is just too harmful to the person, too harmful to society. We have been successful with, uh, with nicotine, uh, I mean not completely, we still have significant numbers, but we, it has been a successful campaign. We, we, we need to do the, the same thing for other drugs including prescription abuse. Just a follow up. I, I, you can call it a semantic difference if you want to, but I think one of the reasons that we've brought down smoking is we've stigmatized smoking. Uh, you know, I, I, there's just no other way around it. We have said it's bad for you. If you call drug addiction a disease and people have no control over it, I think you have just exactly the opposite problem and I think the statistics show that. I, it just is incomprehensible to me that you cannot see the connection between those two. Um, and, and I know the chairman, we I have need to, to go leave, to Ms. but um, Ms. Norton, I'm just- do you have a, that, were, you, were you done with your comment? Yeah, Ms. Norton. Well, I just want to say we brought down uh, smoking addiction because we showed that you die from cancer from it. Uh, we didn't stigmatize people; we scared them in, in, into it, and they uh, and and uh, a new generation at least stopped um, stopped smoking. Um, I, I, what you, what what you had to say uh, was very instructive, and I think very well said about stigma, keeping people from breaking through their disease and taking responsibility for it, your alcoholic anom anonymous is the best example. The first thing you do is to get up and say, I am an alcoholic and, and, and take responsibility for it um, in, 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 a, in, in a place and you, you admit it and you've been reached. And the real question is how to reach these many Americans who uh, some of them are elderly and unintentionally uh, apparently um, uh, becoming a, 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 a addicted uh, where uh, the addiction isn't even defined as such because they, they, they are taking medicine and thus when they begin to, to, to take more and more of it, it may be very difficult to, to recognize that you have become addicted to something the doctor prescribed. How can I be addicted if the doctor prescribed this? Um, I'm not sure that the ordinary ways of, of, of going at addiction so very difficult uh, when we're dealing with drugs and, and, and uh, alcohol would work here. Is there, is there a different way of reaching people who are addicted to medicines that someone has said is good, to, good for you and they just keep taking it uh, and, and without recognizing that this has become an addiction? Is there an, a, a way to reach them that has anything in common with the way we reach addicts or is this a different kind of uh, addiction requiring a different approach? Well, it, it has similarities and differences, and I think you put the finger in one of the most complex issues. How do you, and I, it's one of the ones that we're tackling with clinical trials. How do you treat a person that requires a medication that becomes addicted to it? And more importantly, how do you even recognize that that person is addicted to it? And that's one of the points that Dr. Madras brought up, the importance of why educating medical students as well as uh, residents in their specialty in recognizing the problem of substance abuse and addiction so that when they are prescribing these medications, they can tell their, their patients there is a risk potential for addiction with them. And these are the symptoms that you need to watch so that the individuals themselves can recognize when this is happening to them and alert the physician. We don't have the standards yet nor do we are educating, unfortunately, our medical students in the problem of drug addiction. But that's where the initiative of ONDCP2, which we're partnering, of really bringing it to the medical community is extraordinarily important. Shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't there be something on the label of a medicine that warns 
that addiction could result in if, if uh, this medicine is taken beyond w when it is prescribed? Uh, shouldn't there, I mean, you as, a uh, you as a physician, when you because, are prescribing no, this no, medication, yeah. Yeah, but I'm talking about you get it. Your the, the, the physician describes it. You you're, you're speaking about the physicians who, you know, who are who are, who are rushed. Um, it, 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 if there is something on the label cautioning people about uh, trying to get this prescription beyond when it is prescribed, and and saying that 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 it, it could become addictive. People read those little things that come with uh, uh, prescriptions these days that are very informative. Why not put that on it? Uh, rather than trusting t from individual physician to physician who may be very rushed in, and in the process not always um, give the, 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 the needed I'm so warning. I'm sorry, the, quite, the answer is going to have to be written. We have to suspend the Prime Minister's uh, in the chamber. I think it's important once again to establish that, that Earlier in the hearing, they've testified that a, a prescribed drugs going through a doctor are not really the major problem here. It's going through Internet and outside. But I don't think anybody disagrees that having some kind of a label on it would be helpful for those cases of seniors and a few others. But if we can get some written answers. But uh, for now, because of House rules, uh, the subcommittee stands uh, sus uh, suspended, uh, adjourned until we will reconvene at 12 o'clock promptly. Come to order. Thank you for your uh, patience. Our first, uh, let's see, I need to swear in the witnesses first. Our witnesses on this panel are Misty Fetko, who is a registered nurse who lost her 18 year old son Carl to DXM and fentanyl abuse. Uh, Linda Sirks, who lost her 19 year old son Jason to a prescription drug overdose uh, as a related death. Barbara Van Royen, who lost her 24 year old son Patrick to Oxycontin use. Thea Falco, uh, who is president of Drug Strategies, Stephen Johnson, executive director of Commercial Planning Pain Therapeutics Incorporated, uh, Dr. Uh, Laksimia Mentranti, who is chief executive officer of the American Society for Interventional Pain Physicians, and S Steve Prasura, president and CEO of the Partnership for Drug Free America. If you each raise your right hand. It, uh, do you swear from the testimony you give today is the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. The records show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. That's a, uh, a, as an oversight committee, we always swear in our witnesses. Uh, 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 Svetko, you're, you're sitting where Mark McGuire sat uh, and I uh, couldn't remember the past. I'm hoping that you can today and are willing to talk about it because it's very important that we learn from those experiences. Thank you for being here today. and. Uh, our sympathy goes out to all your families. I know this is difficult, but we appreciate you being willing to talk to the American people and to Congress uh, about the challenges you've faced. Ms. Fetko. Ms. Fetko, if you want to go ahead. Good afternoon, Chairman Souter, Congressman Cummings, and members of the committee. My name is Misty Fetko, and I'm a registered nurse who works in a very emer busy emergency room in Central Ohio. But more importantly, I'm a mother of two wonderful boys. I'm here today to tell you the story of my oldest son, Carl. Carl was my beautiful little boy, eyes like large dark chocolates, an infectious smile, and an insatiable curiosity. I spent years protecting him from harm, but three years ago, harm found a way to sneak in and steal the life of this gifted young man. It was the morning of July 16, 2003. Carl had just graduated from high school and was getting ready to leave for Memphis College of Art in two days. The college had courted him after he had won an award for artwork he created his junior year of high school. The night before, Carl and I had sat in his room and talked with each other about his day at work and the pending trip to Memphis. He smiled and hugged me and said, good night, Mom. I love you. The next morning, I decided to walk the dog before waking Carl. While walking next to his car, I noticed an empty bottle of Robitussin in Carl's back seat. Instantly, I knew something was wrong. 
I had been vigilant for signs of drug abuse in the past and hadn't seen many. I rushed to his bedroom door only to find it locked. After finding my way in, I discovered Carl lying peacefully in bed, motionless with legs crossed, but he wasn't responding to my screams and he wasn't breathing. I quickly transformed from mother to nurse and began CPR, desperately trying to breathe life back into my son. I could not believe my worst fear had happened. My son was dead, but I still did not know what had caused this nightmare. We are a very close family, and I am a very involved mother. Carl had always assured me that he wasn't using alcohol or drugs, and I, the ever watchful mother, believed him as there really wasn't any evidence to prove differently. During Carl's junior year of high school, I found the first evidence of marijuana in his room. After all the talks and reassurances between us, what had changed? I intervened and didn't see anything else suspicious until the summer after his junior year when I found two empty bottles of Robitussin in our basement after a sleepover with friends. I was determined to keep drugs out of our house, but cough medicine? I went to search for answers on the internet but found nothing to increase my concern and then confronted my son. Carl explained that he and his friends had experimented but, had no but nothing had happened and I was reassured once again that he wasn't using hard drugs. Finding no further evidence, I believed him. During his senior year, I knew Carl had developed an interest for marijuana but thought we had addressed it. So why, on that dreadful July morning, did I discover that my son had passed away during the night? The next several months after Carl's death, I frantically searched for answers. During my search, I found two more empty bottles of cough syrup. But it wasn't until after talking with friends and finding journal entries on his computer did I discover that Carl had been abusing cough medicines intermittently over the past two and a half years. Through the internet and his friends, Carl had researched and ed educated himself on how to use these products to get high. He wrote about and enjoyed the hallucinations achieved by abusing cough and cold products. But I wouldn't find out until the morning of Carl's death what he and many others knew about his abuse of cough medicine. The danger that I so desperately tried to keep out of our house had found a way to sneak in secretively. But there were no needles, no powders, <coughs> no smells, none of the typical signs associated with drug abuse. Carl's autopsy report revealed that he had died from a lethal mix of drugs. Fentanyl, a strong prescription narcotic available in a patch, cannabinoids found in marijuana, and DXM, the active ingredient in cough medicines, were found in his system. To this day, I don't know where Carl obtained the narcotic fentanyl. There are no journal entries that talk about his use of painkillers. Was this his first time? We will never know why he made the choice to abuse prescription and over-counter drugs. We only know parts of his story by the words he left behind in his journal. His words are now silent. I have spent many hours trying to find the reason for this unexplainable tragedy. If loving my son were enough, Carl would have lived forever. But I know now that the abuse of over-the-counter and prescription drugs is rapidly emerging. Access to information about this type of drug abuse is prevalent on the internet. Availability to obtain these drugs, which can be lethal when abused, is even more prevalent. But what is even scarier is that these teens have a false sense of security. They have the mindset that these drugs provide a safe high. We as parents need to be aware of these lurking dangers. and We need to make other parents and teens aware of them too. It is with a heavy heart and eternal love for my son that I share his story today to hopefully prevent other families from having to suffer the same heart, excuse me, the same heartache. Thank you for calling this hearing. Sorry. Today to examine the problem of prescription drug abuse in our country. I appreciate you listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I thank you for your uh, willingness to uh, testify. I can see it's uh, very difficult. Uh, Ms. Uh, Linda uh, Circus, is it Circs or? Circs. Thank you for coming also. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Souter, Congressman Cummings, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for holding this hearing today to examine the problem of prescription drug abuse, a subject which is very close to my heart. My name is Linda Sirks, and I'd like to tell you about my son, Jason. Jason was the kind of person that people were drawn to. He made friends easily and had a great sense of humor. He was a caring person and a loving son. He was active in his youth group and participated in several community service projects. He even volunteered at NCADD where I work, a community-based organization in Middlesex County, New Jersey that works to prevent substance abuse. 
When Jason was a little boy, he'd lie about little things, like the time he was seven years old and he swore he had taken a shower, even though I showed him that the tub was completely dry. He, caught, he was caught in little lies like that all the time. As he grew into a young man, we talked about it, and he said he realized how silly it was. I was convinced he had outgrown it. In December of 2003, I discovered that he had not. At the time, Jason was halfway through his second year at college as a pre-pharmacy major. Since his dorm was only 45 minutes away, he came home frequently on weekends, often to work at the pharmacy where he had a job since high school. On one Sunday night, I remember saying goodbye to him at our front door. As I often did, I put my hand on his cheek. I loved the scruffy feel of his stubble. It reminded me that my little boy was growing up. I caressed Jason's cheek that night and told him I love him. Three days later, on the morning of December 17, 2003, my husband called me at work to tell me that the hospital had called to say Jason was brought to the emergency room and we should come as soon as we can. We met nearby and drove to the hospital together in silence. We couldn't imagine what had happened. My husband had spoken to Jason the day before and he said he sounded fine. When we arrived at the hospital, the first thing I remember was being referred to as the parents and being ushered into a private office. I used to work in hospital administration and I knew what that usually meant, but this had to mean something different. We asked to see Jason and were told we had to wait to speak to the doctor. Again, a sign I knew, but I could not accept. I have relived that day in my mind so many times, but I really can't tell you exactly what the doctor said. The message was clear. My beautiful son was gone. Apparently, Jason had been abusing prescription drugs and had overdosed. He was 19 years old. This couldn't be possible. I work in prevention. He knew the dangers. We talked about it often. I was so convinced that he was not using drugs, it became a sort of joke between us. As he would leave home at the end of a weekend, I would say, Jason, don't do drugs. And he would say, I know, Mom, I won't. But he did. While speaking with dozens of Jason's friends after his death, we learned that his abuse of prescription drugs may have started after he began college and apparently started to escalate the summer before he died. I know he believed he was being safe. He used the internet to research the safety of certain drugs and how they react to others. As a pre-pharmacy major, he probably thought he knew more about the drugs than he actually did. We also learned that he had visited several online pharmacies. He ordered drugs from one Mexican pharmacy on the internet that automatically renewed his order each month. I think back to the last several months of my son's life trying to identify any signs I might have missed. During his first year in college, I discovered an unlabeled bottle of pills in Jason's room. After some research, I identified them as a generic form of Ritalin. When I confronted Jason, he told me he had gotten them from a friend who'd been prescribed the medication. He wanted to see if they would help him with his problem focusing in school. I took that opportunity to talk to him about the dangers of abusing prescription drugs. I told him that if he really thought he had ADD, we should pursue it with a clinician. He promised he would stop using the drug, and he even called the counseling office at school to make an appointment for an evaluation. The only other sign I can remember is one, that one weekend when Jason was home, I passed him in the kitchen and noticed that his eyes looked strange. I confronted him right then and there and asked him if he was on something. He said, no, what's wrong? And he went over to a mirror to look and see what I was talking about. He said he didn't know what was wrong. Maybe it was because he was tired. I was suspicious, but his behavior was perfectly normal, so I let it go. There were no other signs until we got that horrible call on December 17, 2003, that changed our lives forever. There are things being done to address this new drug epidemic, but we need to keep moving forward. With the support of my office, we have developed a number of initiatives in our community to raise awareness about the dangers of prescription drug abuse. Something as simple as a mouse pad in a high school has already made a difference in someone's life. Something as profound as supporting the Ryan Haight Internet Pharmacy Consumer Protection Act can save hundreds of lives. Jason touched so many lives in such a short time. He had many friends who cared deeply for him but just didn't know how to help. I believe that education is key to preventing this tragedy from repeating. By sharing Jason's story, I hope we can help other families avoid the kind of heartache that my family has suffered. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. 
Thank you. Next is uh, Ms. Barbara Van uh, Royen. Yes, that's correct. Chairman. Oh, you need to get your mic on. My name is Barbara Van Royen. I'm a California college faculty member and the mother of two sons. My son, Patrick Stewart, died in 2004 at age 24 after ingesting just one OxyContin. He had no other drugs in his system and only a small amount of alcohol. He was a college graduate, a graphic designer, and a certified personal trainer. He made the tragic mistake of believing someone at a 4th of July celebration when he was told that OxyContin was prescription and FDA approved, so therefore safe. As happens with some who are intolerant to opioids, he stopped breathing in his sleep. After five days in a coma, Patrick was reported to have no brain activity. We arranged for organ donation as we said our last goodbyes. Only his lungs could not be shared. The OxyContin had destroyed them. In my grief, I learned very quickly about OxyContin and prescription drug abuse, and what I learned I felt compelled to share with others. So during a partial sabbatical leave from the college, focusing on prescription drug education, I told Patrick's story to hundreds of college and high school students, faculty, staff, and administration. I learned from them as they learned from me. I learned that young people believe prescription FDA-approved drugs are safe and that taking them is not doing drugs. Contrary to the testimony of the first panel at this subcommittee hearing this morning, young people are getting prescriptions from their doctors, and they are getting uh, them from the medicine cabinets of other family members who are getting prescriptions from their doctors. Overprescribing is a huge problem with OxyContin. I also found that most teachers, counselors, administrators, and parents are in the dark about prescription drug abuse. Soon after Patrick's death, I requested that the Anesthetic and Life Support Drugs Advisory Committee of the FDA meet to discuss OxyContin as they had new membership. Repeated contacts with FDA officials, including a letter from Senator Feinstein, yielded no results. So in February 2005, my husband and I submitted a citizen petition to the FDA requesting that OxyContin and Paladone be reformulated as abuse resistant and be relabeled for use with severe pain only. The relabeling alone would powerfully reduce the number of deaths and addictions to OxyContin without compromising terminally ill or dying patients' access to the drug. I've received only one communication from the FDA regarding the citizen petition. That was a letter stating that they needed more time for review. Subsequently, Paladone has been targeted for reformulation. However, last month, the FDA approved Opana, a new sustained release opioid, without first resolving OxyContin problems. It has now been over 10 years since OxyContin first came on the market. The deaths and addiction continue unabated. The 2005 CASA report states that about half of all doctors do not receive medical school training in prescribing controlled substances, addiction, or diversion of drugs. Yet in 2002, OxyContin was one of the most widely prescribed opioid medications, with an increase of 380 percent in a 10-year period. Purdue Pharma's greed and FDA approval of OxyContin for moderate pain are primarily responsible for this increase. I'd also like to mention that, again, contrary to the testimony of the first panel this morning, uh, the 2005 Weissman Opiate Dependency Survey indicates that 71 percent of their patients who are addicted to opioids were originally prescribed an opioid by their doctor. In 2001, the Attorney General of the State of Connecticut pleaded with Purdue Pharma and the FDA to take steps to stem the tide of death and addiction to OxyContin. In 2004, Fred Pauser, another parent who lost his son to OxyContin, came before this very subcommittee and asked the same. Today, more than a decade after OxyContin was first unleashed, I am asking the same once again. There must be, at the very least, more assertive and comprehensive actions by the FDA to protect citizens, increased mandatory physician education regarding selective opioid prescribing and a balanced approach to pain management, youth and family prescription drug education. I come before this committee today because my son is dead. I will forever mourn. I also come before this committee today because my son stands at my right shoulder, and each day he tells me, 
Mother, it is better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. I will light as many candles as necessary, and I hope that you will too. Thank you for the testimony, and if you could get us some more information on the survey, we'll make sure we get that in the yes. record. Next is uh, Ms. Falco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your leadership on this very, very important issue. The testimony that we've just heard, um, I think, overwhelmingly makes the case that action is needed. I am the president of Drug Strategies, a nonprofit research institute, and we have put together in the last year and a half a collaboration including the Weill Medical Center in New York City, the Treatment Research Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and the Harvard Law School, uh, to develop a private-public partnership to try to look at ways in which we can curtail the sale over the internet of these highly addictive, lethal narcotic drugs without prescription. If you type in the term uh, OxyContin without prescription, in any search engine, you will immediately get hundreds of ads uh, willing to sell you, without even pretending to go through a prescription process, these drugs. Um, so we were very concerned about this. Um, we believe uh, our collaboration, uh, that the government has a vital role to play, the federal agencies do, but we thought perhaps progress could be made immediately, even in small ways, by engaging the key points uh, along the uh, chain of internet commerce that basically got the drugs off the internet, through the internet, into the homes of, the, of what are essentially adolescents. Nora Volko testified this morning that this is an epidemic among teens. That, I think, has been proved beyond question. Our partnership uh, looked at the key, uh, the key targets, really. How, how are these drugs purchased over the internet? Well, with credit cards for the most part. So we've been working with MasterCard, Visa, American Express to look at ways and steps they can take without any formal governmental action to try to track down who these illicit sellers really are. The ISPs, the internet service providers, are also very concerned that in effect they have become uh, a river uh, which connects this illicit traffic which increasingly, I must point out, comes from websites hosted overseas. So this is rapidly becoming an international, not just a domestic problem. Um, the ISPs have been extremely responsive in trying to think of technological ways in which they can help filter out um, some of this um, solicitation. Uh, we are also working with as I said, government agencies with the State Department, talk to the Department of Justice about things that might be done. Um, but I think that the profound point here is that this is such a huge problem. We're at the beginning of, of what everyone agrees is an epidemic. We need to look for as many target, targets as we can. I mean, I think everyone today has very specific suggestions about what might be done. Clearly, education and prevention, the Partnership for a Drug-Free America, all of these things are very important. We convened a conference two weeks ago at Harvard Law School of this collaboration, and very high-level representatives from many of these companies were in the process of refining recommendations. We hope very much by the end of the year to have come up with some very specific recommendations in which the private companies the, have already bought into, so to speak, so that we can come forward with a combined voice because we do believe very much in the business response to these things. And we would like very much to continue to work uh, closely with your staff. Uh, the staff has been extremely helpful along the way. And uh, we think that even down the road, we might need to come back and ask for specific legislation. We aren't quite there yet. And we've called our initiative, Keep Internet Neighborhoods Safe. And the same notion that we try to protect our children from the terrible dangers of society today, even getting run over by cars when they're little children, we need to try to make the internet safe for our children. And that's essentially what this private-public collaboration is doing. 
I thank you very much, and I hope we'll come back to you very soon. Thank you very much for your actions and your testimony. Next, Mr. Stephen Johnson. Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Steve Johnson, Executive Director of Commercial Planning at Pain Therapeutics Incorporated. <laughs> Pain Therapeutics is a biopharmaceutical company specializing in the research and development of safer drugs for use in pain management. We commend the subcommittee for holding this hearing, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to discuss what has become an enormous health problem. As the subcommittee knows all too well, prescription drug abuse continues to have a widespread and devastating effect on American families, businesses, and our society as a whole. For abusers, the appeal of a prescription drug typically depends on its dose strength and the ease of which it can be abused. Illustrative is OxyContin, a strong oral opioid drug typically prescribed to treat moderate to severe pain that is also reported to be one of the most commonly abused prescription products. Drug abusers, however, can quickly and simply disable OxyContin's controlled release mechanism, usually by crushing, breaking, or chewing a tablet. The extracted active ingredient, oxycodone, is then ingested, snorted, or injected, immediate releasing, immediately releasing into the body a dose that was intended to be delivered over a 12-hour period. Despite the tireless efforts of thousands of federal, state, and local officials, the incidence of prescription drug abuse has continued to rise even as the rate at which other categories of illicit drug use have decreased or remain stable. The criminal and civil liability and theft associated with products such as OxyContin are discouraging some doctors from prescribing the pain treatments their patients need and dissuading some pharmacists from stocking them. This is a tragedy for pain. This is a tragedy for pain is already too often undertreated. Clearly, additional methods of combating prescription drug abuse are, are necessary. At Pain Therapeutics, we believe novel pharmaceutical technology is a potential clinical critical tool in the battle against prescription drug abuse. For example, our investigational drug product, Remoxy, is a novel form of long-acting oxycodone contained in a highly viscous fluid formulated to resist tampering or accidental misuse. While Remoxy is not intended to be abuse-proof, it is formulated to resist breaking, chewing, or crushing. We believe this investigational drug will also reduce the potential for accidental overdose among patients who may innocently crush or chew a tablet. Moreover, we expect Remoxy's advanced technical technology to be useful in reformulating other commonly abused opioid drugs, as well as other drugs, rendering them similarly abuse-resistant. We are taking a very different approach to reducing prescription drug abuse in developing Oxytrex, an investigational drug product that combines oxycodone, an opioid agonist, with an ultra-low dose of opioid antagonist. Research has shown that the addi addition of an ultra-low dose opioid antagonist blocks activation of the body's excitatory opioid receptors while allowing the agonist to block the transmission of pain signals. We are working to demonstrate that Oxytrex can significantly inhibit pain while simultaneously reducing the risk of physical dependence. In addition to potential law enforcement benefits, the development of such products represents a new and efficient means of addressing current concerns regarding prescription drug safety without further restricting or discouraging access for patients who need such care. Pain Therapeutics is not alone in recognizing the potential benefits of formulating prescription drugs to reduce abuse. In recent years, Congress and various governmental entities and private organizations have recognized the need to develop abuse-resistant pre prescription drugs. Most recently, the Office of National Drug Control Policy recommended continuing to support the efforts of firms that manufacture frequently diverted prescription drugs to reformulate their products so as to reduce diversion and abuse. Additionally, NIDA Director Dr. Nora Volkov recently co-authored a paper on opioid analgesic abuse calling for development of less abusable but still potent forms of opioid agents, as well as combinations of medications that can be given to treat pain but to minimize the chances of addiction. In 2005, a comprehensive report by the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University went even further, asserting, quote, the FDA should require pharmaceutical companies manufacturing controlled drugs to formulate or reformulate the drugs where possible to minimize the risk of abuse. 
Pharmaceutical companies should be required to demonstrate in their application materials for FDA approval of new drugs that they have made every effort to formulate the drug in such a way that avoids or at least minimizes the drug's potential for abuse, end quote. Now we must turn these statements into real public health and law enforcement achievements. Currently there are no Schedule II prescription drugs on the market specifically formulated to resist or reduce abuse. Moreover, no statute, regulation, or guidance specifically addresses issues that are critical to determining whether it will continue to be worthwhile to invest in the research and development to bring such products to market. This subcommittee can play a unique role in ensuring that agencies across government to coordinate, or coordinate their efforts to maximize the benefits of pharmaceutical technology in addressing drug abuse and misuse. To conclude, we have four recommendations. Number one, applications to market prescription drugs that are spe specially formulated to deter abuse or misuse should be eligible for priority review. Number two, <coughs> FDA should permit labeling that accurately conveys the specific means of abuse or misuse to which a product has been shown to be resistant. And the agency should not require companies to demonstrate resistance to all potential methods of abuse and misuse, such as those that are relatively uncommon. We welcome FDA's recent announcement that it intends to develop this year guidance for industry in this area. We are hopeful that prompt issuance of these documents will eliminate some of the current ambiguity and encourage the development of abuse resistant prescription drugs by framing reasonable standards for approval and accurate labeling that clearly differentiates products incorporating such technologies from products providing no abuse and misuse deterrent. Number three, risk management plans for potentially abusable drug products should take into account these innovative safeguards and encourage physicians to prescribe those products that incorporate features that deter abuse and misuse. And number four, given the cost of prescription drug abuse and misuse to our health care system, we must ensure that both private and governmental payers such as Medicare and Medicaid recognize the benefits of these products and favor their use in formularies. Mr. Chairman, we are especially grateful to you and the other members of the subcommittee for calling attention to this issue today. Pain Therapeutics looks forward to working with Congress, FDA, DEA, and other governmental agencies to continue to promote the, the development of innovative approaches to more effectively address the epidemic of prescri pres prescription drug abuse. Thank you. It would be nice if they took a normal person's definition of prompt to not a government definition of prompt. Uh, Dr. Aman Chikati. Mr. Chairman. On behalf of the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, I would like to thank you, the committee members and staff, for giving us this opportunity to present our views. My name is uh, Lakshmaya Manchikanti. I'm a practicing physician from Paducah, Kentucky. I'm also the president of, sorry, CEO of American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. The issues are very close to me as a physician and as the CEO of ASIP representing approximately 3,700 members. I have published multiple articles on this subject. Further, ASIP has started educational and certification programs in controlled substance management, published guidelines, and was instrumental in the design and passage of the National All Schedules Prescription Electronic Reporting Act, also known as NASPR. As interventional pain physicians, our members are involved in prescribing controlled substances. However, our primary modality of treatment is interventional techniques. I have provided the committee with written information. During the next few minutes, I would like to discuss specific issues related to chronic pain and prescription drugs. Today, chronic pain requiring treatment is estimated in approximately 10 to 30 percent of the population in the United States. As we heard from the committee and witnesses, psychotherapeutic drugs, which include pain relievers, tranquilizers, stimulants, and sedatives are the second leading category of illicit drug use. Between 1992 to 1990, sorry, 2003, the U.S. population increased 14 percent, but the number of people abusing prescription controlled substances increased 94 percent. Mr. Chairman, as you have stated in your opening statement, the increase of prescription controlled substances was double the increase of marijuana, five times the that of cocaine and 60 times the increase of heroin. In recent years, there have been sharp increases in the therapeutic use of controlled substances coupled with misuse and abuse. Today, 90 percent of the patients presenting to and in pain management centers are on opioids. 
Opioid prescriptions and sales are increasing rapidly. Drug abuse in chronic pain management is common. Today, with all the available uh, tools, with prescription monitoring programs, random drug testing, and vigilance, it has been reported that uh, 9 to 20 percent of the patients still abuse the drugs. In addition, illicit drug use is also common in as many as 32 percent of the patients. Drug diversion is an epidemic in the United States. The majority of physicians perceive doctor shopping as the major mechanism of diversion. Patients and physicians alike are facing a multitude of problems. Physicians feel that patients deceive and manipulate the doctors and the authorities are on their tail, whereas patients feel they are undertreated for their pain and it is their fundamental right to be pain-free by whatever means. Many programs are in place to address the prescription drug abuse and epidemic. The Drug Enforcement Agency's Agency is in the forefront of it. NASPR was signed into law on August 11, 2005, but it is moving extremely slow with no funding committed yet. At the present time, there are approximately 32 or 33 state programs under DEA and Harold Rogers program. These programs are reactive rather than proactive, and they are limited to a single state. Strategies to combat this epidemic and improve patient care include mandatory and continuing education for physicians, pharmacists, and public. The public must be educated on non-opioid techniques of chronic pain management and the adverse effects of opioid treatment. In addition, a separate residency program in interventional pain management is ideal and necessary. Enactment of NASPR in all states is the major solution for the existing problems. This will benefit physicians, patients, and the DEA with honest patients receiving appropriate treatment and physicians providing proper treatment without hassles. Other strategies may include increased scrutiny of methadone clinics. Nobody has discussed that issue so far. Increased availability of outpatient detoxification and rehabilitation. Improvement of relations of DEA with providers and public. And finally, elimination of internet pharmacies. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Passerup. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Souter. Also, thanks to uh, Ranking Member Cummings and the subcommittee for inviting the partnership here to testify today. I've also got to take this opportunity to thank the subcommittee and especially you as its leadership for your steadfast dedication over the last several years to the drug issue and really helping the country and the American family navigate through some of the issues we've been faced with. So on behalf of all of us in prevention, treatment and law enforcement, I did want to get out that one bit of thanks before I got into my testimony. We are encouraged, as you've heard in the testimony today, that drug use among teens has decreased 19 percent since 2001. However, when you examine individual drugs of abuse, there are very troubling trends, including the abuse of methamphetamine regionally, a resurgence in inhalants and in prescription and over-the-counter uh, medicines. The partnership is particularly concerned about this new tier of teen abuse that we've dubbed Generation Rx, which is really a cohort of young people for whom farming with a pH or the behavior of partying or abusing a host of medicines to get high has become normative. This is not an issue of individual products, as we've heard, but rather it's a broad and negative behavior that has become far too common and acceptable in today's teen culture. These are medications that, when used as directed, improve health and even save lives. But there's a world of difference between good medicine and bad behavior. Um, the partnership and our partners have been focused on this, doing research over the last year and a half. We're targeting this behavior now, and our dedication is to change this dangerous conduct. Our 18th Annual Partnership Attitude Tracking Study, or PATS as you know it, examines both teen drug use and attitudes. And that study confirmed that an alarming number of today's teenagers are more likely to have abused medicines than a variety of illegal drugs like ecstasy, cocaine, crack, and methamphetamine. Nearly one in five, or 4.5 million teens, has tried a prescription medication to get high. And one in 10, or 2.4 million teens, report abusing cough medicine to get high. 
There is also a false sense of security about abusing medications because they are FDA approved, legitimate and otherwise beneficial products in the medicine cabinet. The PAT study shows that there is much work to be done to educate teens about the dangers of intentional abuse. Two in five teens, or 9.4 million, mistakenly agree that prescription medicines, even when not prescribed by a doctor, are much safer to use than illicit drugs. Nearly one-third of teens, or 7.3 million, believe that there is nothing wrong with using prescription drugs once in a while without a prescription. More than half of teens, 13 million, don't strongly agree that using cough medicines to get high is risky. Teens are also telling us in our studies that it is very easy for them to gain access to these medicines. Teens say that they are easily available in the medicine cabinet at home or at a friend's house. They are easy to get through other people's prescriptions. And teens say these medications are available everywhere, including the Internet. Easy access combined with very little understanding of the consequences can be a lethal combination. And it has all of us at the partnership quite concerned. What's more, today's cohort of parents is the most drug experienced in history, but they do not understand this new form of abuse among teenagers. As a result, they think that if they've talked about street drugs, they've done their job. Parents need to be aware of the drugs teens abuse today, including medicines, are not the same drugs as in decades past. Only through education and parental involvement can we be successful. Once parents are educated about the intentional abuse of these products, then they can get through to their kids about the dangers. We know who kids who learn a lot about drug use at home are up to half as likely to use. But while 9 out of 10 parents say they have talked about the dangers, fewer than one-third of teens say they learn a lot at home about the risks of drugs. And we know from the additional studies only one-third of parents say they have talked to their kids specifically about the risks of abusing medicines to get high. Focus groups show parents generally don't think their teen could be vulnerable to the temptation of prescription or over-the-counter drug abuse. They don't understand the idea of this behavior, and far too many, uh, they, and like far too many teens, they somehow think that abusing medicines is somehow safer than illicit street drugs, and that's something that has got to change. That's why the partnership and our partners, including the Consumer Health Care Products Association and its members, launched a new education campaign on May 1st that I can sum up in three words, educate, communicate and safeguard. As a parent, educate yourself about the medicines kids are abusing. Secondly, communicate with your kids on this subject and dispel the notion, both for yourself and for your kids, that these medicines can be safely abused. And finally, safeguard your medications, limiting access to them and keeping track of the quantities you have in your home and making sure your family and friends do the same. Parents are going to see that message on television, in newspapers, in magazine ads and on the radio. The Internet also plays an important role with resources for parents at drugfree.org and specifically for teenagers who visit dxmstories.com. The committee asked that we show examples of the new campaign and again these were developed with the Consumer Health Care Products Association and based in our consumer research. Hopefully we have. teens have found a whole new way to get high on drugs that are all over the neighborhood. Legal drugs they can get anytime they want for free in almost any home in America. Cough medicines, prescription painkillers. Last year more teens intentionally abused them than ecstasy, meth and heroin combined. Learn how to talk to your kids about the drugs they get at home at drugfree.org. There's a frightening new kind of drug abuse creeping into our neighborhoods. It's already bigger with teens than ecstasy, meth, and heroin combined. And it can be just as dangerous. So who's supplying your kids? You are. Prescription drugs, ordinary cough remedies, used as directed, it's medicine. Intentionally abused, it's a free high. Talk to your kids. Learn how at drugfree.org. They don't sell cookies anymore. To learn more, visit drugfree.org. 
So our bottom line is not simple awareness, but rather changing attitudes and behaviors. We're going to be evaluating this effort over the next three to five years, and we know through the research that's already been done that research-based communications can change behaviors. This is a critical health, um, public health problem, and we are the partnership are convinced that if this issue gets the attention it needs and industry is motivated in joining us in finding solutions, and when this campaign get, gets the visibility it needs itself, we're going to be successful in rooting out this behavior and changing attitudes, changing behaviors. I want to thank the committee and Please know that our dedication is to working with you to find solutions on this problem. Thanks. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for showing the ads as well. Uh, I have a few uh, questions. Uh, Mr. Cummings, of course, will uh, have, a, uh, as I understand, a few questions as well. Um, but if we could start with Mr. Johnson. Um, my understanding is that the makers of OxyContin uh, said it would be more than a decade to, it would take more than a decade to reformulate OxyContin uh, to be abuse resistant in that form. Um, you know, I'm not asking you to divulge industry secrets or anything uh, of that nature, but, um, or, or, you know, describing the specifics of how the product works, but, you know, are there some, what's the difference here? You know, it's a large company that produces OxyContin. Um, What's the problem? Why, you know, you know, why are they claiming this can't be done anytime soon? Uh, I can't comment on or or guess as to reasons why another company uh, can't move forward in this area. But uh, it's uh, in our our efforts are all about reformulating the drug to protect against the common methods of abuse, which have been delineated on the panel uh, and by the DEA. <coughs> Uh, if you if you reformulate using materials that are resistant or deterrent to abuse, then you essentially lock in drug for patients who are trying to abuse or mechanically get drug out of the system. If you take the drug as directed per prescriptive practices, then it delivers the, the dose to the patient over time. So Can you describe how your product works differently? It's a gel-based uh, delivery system. This is an example of the main ingredient. Uh, it's called sucrose acetate isobutyrate. I'm not a scientist, but um, that's, that's <laughs> Sounds what it's like called. <laughs> SAIB. Uh, at any rate, it's a very viscous, it's a, called a creeping fluid. I turned it on its side about 15 minutes ago and it hasn't completely gone that way. Uh, that's the main ingredient. Then we add another, uh, uh, not, another uh, uh, additional excipients, I should say to uh, combat specific types of abuse. So again, if you take the drug as prescribed, it delivers the dose nicely over a 12-hour period and the patient gets pain relief. If, on the other hand, someone tries to abuse the drug at a party, someone tries to crush it and snort it, you can't freeze it to a temperature that makes it brittle enough to actually defragment the, the delivery system and turn it into just drug, as you can with some of the commonly available drugs. You can't, uh, we, we've, we're doing studies to look at injecting the drug and we've gotten down as far as an 18 gauge needle which is very large and uh, even if you get the drug into a syringe, uh, it still pops the needle off the end of the syringe. Um, when you challenge the drug with alcohol, which is a common method of abuse of some of the others, we have a, an excipient that locks in the drug. So some gets out, but a very small percentage, somewhere around 20% of drug gets out. So if someone is playing with it, you know, hopefully uh, they'll learn from a, from a mistake and, and wake up the next morning. Um, those are some of the differences. Well, do you think uh, is, it's the absence of laws that uh, on the books uh, about abuse resistant <coughs> prescription drugs uh, that is contributing to very few of them being on the market. I, I think uh, it creates a situation of ambivalence uh, or ambiguity, rather. And, and there's, uh, where there's ambiguity, there's, there's uncertainty. Um, from a business perspective, you don't want to invest your money in something that is highly risky unless you have money to throw away, uh, which, which most companies don't, I think. Um, you want to de-risk it as much as possible. There's no clinical path for approval of these drugs. There's no 
guidance to tell industry what you need to do and what hurdles you need to cross to get these drugs approved. So I think the lack of, of guidance is, is a significant issue. Okay. Well, since this is sort of the general perception and understanding from the industry, um, there's this perception that prescription drugs, as the ads outline, that they're somehow safe to abuse, as, as astronomically uh, idiotic as that seems in this committee room, it's a reality outside in America. Uh, do you think it's um, that idea that FDA approved drugs or um, that somehow they're safe and they're approved and uh, that this minimizes um, the perception among youth that it's okay? Um, I mean, if, if we could just have the whole panel touch on that. Give your comments on that. In the hundreds and hundreds of college and high school students that I've spoken with over the past year, I would say unequivocally that is um, an issue. In addition to which, what I hear from young people is that they have grown up in a culture of taking some kind of medication for almost every ache and pain that comes along. And so to them, you know, taking a prescription pill is almost in some instances like taking a vitamin or taking an aspirin if you have a headache or gosh, you've got a stomach ache, you know, take a little of this or take a little of that. So many of the young people I speak to, taking a medication is nothing to them. They've grown up in that culture. I think one of the keys that we saw in the research, again, was teens and parents both sh shared the same view. Actually, parents were a little bit further beyond teens, believing that this was somehow a safer version of drug abuse. There was less stigma attached to this. Um, parents got that their own homes might have been a source of it, but yet they weren't doing anything to safeguard it. And I think it's the ubiquity and benefit of medicines in our lives. These are things that we all use through the course of a year to make us feel better and improve our lives. That safety veil, which is so important in something that the American society has given us, is now working against us in this case. And our kids are thinking somehow this is a safer alternative. And it's a tragically wrong conclusion, as you've heard this morning and, and from folks here. And I just want to add, uh, speaking with Carl's friends after he passed away, um, they just could not believe that something like this could have resulted from abusing these drugs. They were absolutely incredulous. They had no idea. And these were intelligent young men. I had the same experience. I spoke with a number of Jason's friends, and they just they were amazed and, and shocked that this could have happened to him. I just want to add a word about the ready availability of these drugs beyond the, the family medicine cabinet. The internet is going to emerge increasingly as the route for obtaining these drugs. Every kid in America is online at least three or four hours a day. Very easy to get these drugs without prescription, without the pretense of a prescription. And as, in fact, we increase our ability to control the U.S. supplies and the U.S. requirements for prescriptions, this business will move offshore. It already has started to do so. And that will make control, uh, at least from the supply end, even more difficult. That's why it's so important to engage the private sector players in this, the, the carriers who deliver the drugs, the credit card companies uh, through which these drugs are purchased, the banks which approve the credit cards, and of course there is this very important part of uh, education, which by the way the search engines and the internet service providers can also do through their huge networks and huge customer bases. That's what we're talking about right now, coming back to you with recommendations along those lines. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned uh, selling prescription drugs over the internet. I had a pharmacy that was uh, uh, relieved of its uh, license uh, to issue drugs in the state of North Carolina because they were sending drugs across the country, which was strictly prohibited under North Carolina law. So it was interesting to see a, the pharmacy board in North Carolina really take on a challenge that may be uh, largely, uh, you, you know, the Midwest, uh, the West Coast issue 
uh, because this pharmacy was sending drugs across the country and how they were actually protecting people. So that's very helpful. And with that, my time has expired. And uh, the ranking member, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me, uh, let me just ask a few questions here. Um, Ms. Ms. Falco? Yes, sir. How soon you all plan to come with those recommendations? And um, as I said a little bit earlier, this is something that's been going on for a long time, and I'm just trying to figure out. Um, I guess the older I get, the more I, I get frustrated. Uh, you know, um, we study stuff. And then we put it on the shelf, then we dust it off, warm it up, bring it back out. And a lot of times, nothing happens. And so, and I'm not, believe me, I'm glad you're trying to do something. I'm, we are up here, and we have just as much responsibility. But one of the things that I've concluded is that whenever anything is driven by money and profit, it's hard. It's hard to, to stop it because it, it basically takes on a culture and a life of its own. And so uh, how soon do you think we can we'll see these recommendations and what is the process of getting them to us? Fortunately, we've had the benefit of being able to work with committee staff. Mm -hmm. We're on a very fast track because we share your frustration. We hope that before the end of the year, we will have developed very clear, specific recommendations that touch a wide range of private sector players in the internet uh, drug uh, commerce, e-commerce. Um, and I think that there will be some very, uh, hopefully some very specific recommendations that Congress might undertake. I think the interest of this committee and your persistence in staying with this issue, in spite of the terrible frustration of studies that don't result in anything, have already begun to have an impact on the willingness of private companies to step up to the plate. They're not going to make their, I don't, I'm not speaking on behalf of any specific company, but let me just say that the credit card companies are not making most of their money off this kind of commerce. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be associated with uh, bringing uh, these terrible drugs into the homes of our, our children. Um, I, I think there's a lot of uh, common ground out there in the public sector and the private sector that we can really, uh, really work on. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we can continue to work with your staff, we'll be back to you uh, very soon. Well, to uh, Ms. Fetko, Ms. Sirks, and Ms. Van Ruyen, Ruyen mm -hmm. I want to, first of all, express my sympathy to all of you. And I want to thank you for being a part of this and what you're doing. I've often said that out of some of the most tragic things that happen can come some good things. Sadly, so often we have to suffer so that others might live and so that others might have a better life. And um, I thank you all for not taking your grief and going off into a corner and coming out and saying, look, you know, I want to make sure that this doesn't happen to anybody else. And so I thank you not only on behalf of our committee, but on behalf of so many people that will be affected by what you do that you will never meet and you will never know because they won't, uh, they, and they may not know you, but because of what you do today, you may very well, and I'm sure you will save many, many people and save a lot of mothers from going through the pain that you've gone through. Is there something that when you go back and you reflect uh, on what you've seen and what you've experienced, is there anything other than in addition to what you've said that you would have loved to have seen government do? We're here, here, here we're in the business of trying to create laws. And um, one of the things that we did see is that when we took on the steroid issue it was largely because of children. We were tired of seeing children emulate the great baseball, basketball, football players. And a lot of children did not understand that when they tried to emulate these big time players, that they could literally destroy their, their bodies. And so we heard testimony from, from, from parents who came in here and said, you know, we lost our son because he was trying to be like 
somebody he had seen on television. And I'll never forget when we did that, when we held those hearings, a lot of people said, oh, you're just grandstanding, it doesn't, it, you shouldn't be involved in this process. It, it's none of your business. Um, but I do believe that it has had a tremendous impact. And so what we're trying to figure out constantly is what is it that we can do uh, to try to, as legislators, to try to help with the problem. And understand with the steroid issue, it wasn't just what we were not able to do legislatively, but it was, goes back to what Ms. Falco was saying. Um, a lot of times when the voices come from, from the representatives of the people, then industry and a whole lot of other folks begin to do things uh, a little different than they would normally do them because they don't want laws to come down, you know, us to create laws that affect them in a way that they might you know, they may very well not feel very comfortable with. So are there any things that you can think of that you haven't already testified to that you would have loved to see government do? Yes. I'm listening. Um, this was in my written testimony, but not in my summation. Um, national prescription monitoring systems have to be in place, and there needs to be federal appropriation of funds for that. Um, right now in California, we most recently, as of January 2006, implemented an expanded prescription drug monitoring program known as CURES. This is just the first leg of a monitoring system that would, the second leg would involve having online access for all physicians and um, pharmacists to information on any patient on controlled substances. The really unfortunate piece of this is that this expansion of the program in California only came about because Bob and Carmen Pack of Danville, California lost their seven-year-old and their ten-year-old children when a woman who was addicted to Vicodin and was under the influence of Vicodin ran into them with her car. And they found out during the trial that she had had six, prior to the crash, she had had six prescriptions for Vicodin filled from six different physicians all within the same HMO, none of whom corroborated any of the claims of injuries that she had. So um, obviously our prescription monitoring systems in our states are failing and the PACs are at a point right now where this, there's only enough state funding for the first leg of it. They are looking to the pharmaceutical companies and to the federal government for help in funding of the second leg of this prescription monitoring uh, cures program in California. So that, that's one way I see that the government can help. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Serks? Ms. Let's go. Um, Let's go. A couple of things that um, as I evaluated my experience, I wish that Carl was not able to walk into a pharmacy and purchase the cough syrups. Um, also, in regards to the fentanyl, my suspicions is that it came from a home where a, a patient was being cared for at home. Um, and finding ways to um, increase the accountability for the prescription drugs that are available to those patients in the home as far as dispensing accountability for how many, um, how much drug is there and disposing of it after its use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we've, it's already been mentioned, I think it's really critical that we find a way to control the easy accessibility of these drugs over the internet. Um, the, the recommendations that Drug Strategies is working on sounds like it will um, approach that protection of our children. I also think that um, education and prevention um, needs to be supported. I know. Um, I work in prevention and we do a lot to educate um, young people and parents and um, that needs to be across the board, across the country. Everyone needs to have access to all the information and, and um, so there needs, I think there needs to be support of, of the prevention efforts. Are you, uh, are you working, do you, have you worked with these ladies, um, Ms. Falcon? Not yet. But we're going to. We've already discussed that. Oh, good. I just wanted to make sure that you that you do that. Um, again, I want to thank all of you for your your testimony. Um, 
I don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you this, that um, we're going to stick with the issue uh, because it is so important. And um, thank, you, thank all of you very much. Thank you. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to come to Capitol Hill and tell your stories. Um, and we certainly appreciate your input and guidance. Uh, for those that were not able to attend the committee hearing, they will read the testimony, uh, as I did, uh, because of a prior engagement. So thank you for your written to testimony. Thank you for answering questions. And thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, and have a wonderful afternoon. This committee meeting is adjourned. Thursday on the C-SPAN networks. On Washington Journal, two members of Congress on the Middle East conflict and a political science professor from Iran on Hezbollah. The House works on a bill to improve the efficiency of federal agencies and another dealing with the availability and security of health information technology. On C-SPAN 2, the Senate's agreed to begin legislative work on a bill to allow oil drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. And on C-SPAN 3, a confirmation hearing for John Bolton to be U.S. representative to the United Nations. He's been serving in that role under a recess appointment, which expires in January 2007. C-SPAN 3 history focuses on railroads and mass transportation security issues starting at 10 p.m. Eastern.